Ce? You'll be able to see your slides from here. Oh, nice. And then you go forward with this one. Mm -hmm. And then if you also want to use this one, but you probably don't. Like That's if you are. Just here, right? Yeah, just hit that and it'll advance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you very much. And pointer And just to remember that 10 minutes is the limitation of the clinical presentation. 10. Okay. Ten. okay. We have to shorten the meeting. <laughs> no problem. Okay. And this is Michelle Joshua. Yes, we know. Okay, well, good. Stan has it. The slide advances just to the green yes, button. Just Perfect. the green button. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we're about ready to get started. You you stay down there. I'm you do this. Good morning. Everybody will have a seat. We'll get started in just a moment. Good morning. I'm Pat Brooks from CMS. I'm one of the co-chairs for the meeting today, the ICD-10 Coordination and Maintenance Committee meeting. And we're pleased to welcome you to the first meeting after the very successful implementation of ICD-10 this last October 1st, 2015. And we're so pleased to report that no sky fell and there were no major issues. We had no big billing problems and, and life is good. And we still have a code for run into a lamppost. And we understand they use that a lot in London where people texting actually do run into a lamppost a great deal. We had a few glitches with our posting of our final handouts. Uh, and so Maddie Hugh was working late into the night to work all those out. But we understand right now that our handouts and agenda are posted on the CMS website. So those of you who are on the phone or live stream can look at those, and those of you in the room can access those and read those later. Um, but they are available, the complete handouts. The ICD-10 Coordination and Maintenance Committee, for those of you who have not attended before, is a public forum to discuss updates to the ICD-10 coding system. There's a part that addresses the procedure codes, ICD-10 PCS, which CMS coordinates. And there's a separate part which addresses the diagnosis codes, ICD-10 CM, which Donna Pickett from uh, CDC addresses. Since our meeting needs to end by 2 p.m. tomorrow, we're trying to be very time conscious today to provide Donna a couple of hours at the end of the day to start her diagnosis topic. So please be aware that she will be starting hers this afternoon and that we will be doing our best to complete our part of the meeting no later than 2 or 2.30. And so we've asked all our clinical presenters to kindly um, limit their presentations to 10 minutes and, and I'm sure they'll do a great job of being succinct and explaining what the issues are. We are going to present our proposed code updates that have been requested, and those in the audience will be given a chance to comment or ask questions. We are not going to make any final decisions on the meeting today. We will present CMS recommendations of what we think might be a good code selection, but we have made no final decisions. We're very anxious to hear what the public has to say. And so we'll take comments from the floor today. Some of you will go home and think through something and maybe even want to change your mind about what you want to recommend, and that's fine. We want to get your written comments about what you think we should do, and we evaluate all those written comments. 
Now, if we had planned to have a April 1st code update, then we would have had to um, had a request at the September Coordination and Maintenance Committee meeting for an expedited code update. And if we had, they would have, we would have made that decision by now. There were no requests for an April 1st code update at the September meeting. Therefore, there won't be any updates until October 1st, 2016. You have until April the 8th, 2016 to make comments on anything you hear discussed today. So we would encourage you to think about stuff after the meeting and send those. Notice on this slide that we now have a new email. Uh, well, this slide doesn't have it on here, but in your handouts, we have a new email address for you to send comments to us. It's no longer my name, and we'll have to see if it appears on the later slides. Let me just check real quick, and I'll read it to you, and it will be in the handouts. It looks like this one didn't have it correctly, but it's real easy to write down. It goes to ICD Procedure Code Request. That's ICD Procedure Code Request at CMS hhs.gov. Now Donna Pickett was ahead of things and so she's had a generic email address for all the code requests for some time and you'll see that on this slide. The good news is that the partial code freeze has ended. That partial code freeze went on longer than expected because of all the delays with ICD-10. You, those of you who participate in this committee know that there were many requests for us not to do wholesale code updates until we finished implementing ICD-10. So that's ended. Regular code updates will happen from now on. And October 1st will be proof that that has happened. In April 2016, you'll see our proposed rule, and it will include code titles of all new, deleted, and revised ICD-10 PCS and CM code titles that have been finalized as of this meeting. Nothing from this meeting will be in the proposed rule. After this meeting, you'll see additional codes that are uh, included and will be implemented on October 1st in the August 1st final rule. And that's clearly described in the timeline we inserted into your handout. So if you're confused about that, review the timeline and see how that works out. June 2016 is when you'll see the complete code addendum. And you'll look on the CMS website for ICD-10 PCS for the FY 2017 addendum. And you'll look on the CDC website to find the ICD-10 CM uh, addenda and code updates. And this year we will be simply linking from the CMS website to CDC for you to find all the addenda for their diagnosis. We will be posting updates to the GEMS in August, and that will include any updates that happen as of this year. July uh, the 15th is the deadline if you want to ask for a code update to be discussed at our next meeting, and our next meeting is September 13th and 14th. So send those to me, and then we will um, schedule that for the agenda. At this meeting, you can participate in three ways. We have a number of people in the audience here today who will be able to comment and ask questions. We have additional people who are listening on a free conference line we provided. And we have a third group that's participating through free live stream. And the people on live stream and the conference calls will not be able to make comments or ask questions. But we do encourage that group of people to send in your comments after the meeting. We hope that providing all three of those gives people a good way to help us make the best decision on code updates. And once again, April the 8th is the day that you send in your final code updates. And frankly, the slide isn't up to date, but in the handouts you'll see the new ICD code request uh, email. If he goes to either one, I'll make sure that they're uh, addressed. Okay, so there's another item on our agenda today that you've asked for for a couple of years, and there's handouts that describe this in greater detail. But I'm now going to discuss the status of all those codes that we've discussed during the partial code freeze. As you know, we would only address those that were for new technology and the annual updates during the code freeze, and everything else was being held until October 1, 2016. We have posted on the CMS uh, website, and it's visible now, a file that lists, as of today, 
all codes that have been approved as new, revised, and deleted ICD-10 PCS codes. And so you can review those at your leisure. This is the complete backlog. There will be additional codes added to that after this meeting, but, but people wanted to know how many we had so far, and so we've made that available. Here's the magic number as of today. As of today, not including codes discussed today, for fiscal year 2017, there will be 75,625 codes, 3,651 new codes, and 487 revised codes titles. So we've been quite busy during this partial code freeze. There's more detail in the handout, but I'll just show you this slide that shows that of uh, the new codes, 97% were cardiovascular uh, codes. And most of those came from things such as putting in device values for multiple intraluminal devices and applying the qualifier bifurcation to many of the artery body parts. Others included more specific body parts for thoracic aorta, some congenital cardiac procedures, and the placement of intravascular neurostimulators. So that was many of the new codes. All of the revised code titles so far have come from the heart and great vessels, and they resulted from the changing from the coronary artery number of sites to the number of vessels, and changing the previously nonspecific thoracic aorta body part to specify the descending thoracic aorta. We also have other code issues that are, uh, we've proved so far. And uh, those of you who were at prior meetings with the orthopedists know that we are uh, planning to expand detail in the root operation removal and revision in the lower uh, joint body system and add unique codes for unicondylar knee replacement. We also have new codes for things such as entrant cranial administration of substance, such as gliadel chemotherapy wafer, getting an open approach. So we have other general new codes, face transplant, hand transplant, and donor organ perfusion. So the codes discussed today, once again, are for consideration of October 1st, 2016. Those will be in addition to the number 3,651 already discussed. And so with the end of the partial code freeze, you will no longer say, I want a new code and I need technology to justify implementation. We will consider all issues equally for this October 1st, 2016. And that concludes this part of the presentation. And I would encourage all of you to look at that file that we posted on the page that describes the code updates so far and understand many in AHEMA and AHA wanted to know about the number of codes so they could begin planning for their continuing education and how much work was involved. Uh, Maddie Hugh had, um, oh, she's here. Maddie, are you ready to go? No. We're going to give Maddie a little break. She was working quite late last night getting those files up for this morning, and the challenges cannot be described in getting the file posted this morning. So we really appreciate all her efforts. So I'm going to ask if you, uh, the control room, if you wouldn't mind going to topic two, oxidized zirconium on polyethylene bearing surfaces. And those of you who are following through the handouts while they get that together, You will turn to page 15. And I would like to ask uh, Gordon Hunter, Dr. Gordon Hunter, to come forward. And he's going to describe for us the issue this morning, which is we have four types of bearing surfaces currently available for the hip joint. And they've asked us to add a, a type oxidized zirconium on poly ethylene, which is a type of ceramic bearing surface, but they would like to break that out and have a unique code for this one. So we will, uh, this is not a new technology issue, so we will ask Dr. Hunter to explain the clinical background for you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak and to talk about this subject. I've worked for Smith & Nephew for 22 years. Uh, my PhD is in metallurgy. Uh, received from MIT, and uh, 
my, my specialization is in implementation of new technology. This is the technology we're talking about, which is an oxidized zirconium femoral component for knees, and we're also talking about the same type of component for hips. And this is the current standard technology, the metal implant that is used. <clears throat> so let me, so why are we here? The guidance for using oxidized zirconium coating is to uh, coat it as a uh, ceramic on polyethylene. But what I want to explain is that it's not a ceramic and it isn't a metal either. It is a combination of these two types of materials. Many questions that have come up about this coating, a lot of confusion uh, from the, from the uh, hospitals and other healthcare uh, workers. And more precise codes would allow us to uh, track, the, uh, track these types of implants and understand how they are performing. Uh, and we could gain critical data on figuring out how these are performing. The oxidized zirconium technology is an innovative concept for both hips and knees. It has the toughness of a metal body, but uh, is not brittle like a ceramic. Uh, the surface is transformed. This is not a coating, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and its uh, main purpose is to reduce wear for articular bearings, and it also can reduce the uh, release of metal ions from the component as well for, uh, if, if those are concerned. Uh, this technology has been called ceramicized metal in some of the registries. Uh, Smith & Nephew has trademarked it as oxinium material, so you may have heard it as those things. And it did win the ASM International uh, Mater Engineering Materials Achievement Award in 2005. It's the only technology so awarded in 2005, and it's for an outstanding application of materials technology. Other technologies that have won this type of award are uh, Kevlar, uh, magnetic recording tape, and so on. So let me briefly explain what is the difference between a ceramic and a metal. First of all, what is a metal? A metal, uh, well, they're metal elements. Uh, they're on the periodic chart, and I boxed them in there. They want to give up electrons. They do uh, take a regular uh, structure, a crystalline structure, uh, but because they all want to give up electrons, those atoms can move against each other relatively easily. That gives you a ductile material. It also gives you a material that can absorb and impact energy without fracturing. So it's good for uh, those kind of applications where you're going to get a lot of impact. Uh, by making an alloy with different atomic sizes, you can restrict the ability of these atoms to move against each other and increase the hardness. And so with cobalt chrome, you have an alloy of two different types of metal elements, cobalt and chrome, which are there and there on the periodic chart. While this works really well for most patients, uh, there are some limitations. Uh, one is it that it can corrode. It's a reactive material. Uh, and then that puts metal ions into the body, which can cause uh, biological impact. The surface is also uh, softer than some of the debris that can be in the joint, uh, ceramic particles, metal fretting debris, bone particles, and so on. And when those particles slide against the surface, they furrow it like a farmer plowing his field, and they create a valley, which is what we call a scratch, and then peaks on either side. And those peaks, when the polyethylene rubs against them, that is what causes uh, increased wear. Now, one way to solve that is to uh, create a very harder surface, and one way to do that is with a ceramic. Oh, so that's a... That's the metal ball, that's the metal knee that you would normally see. Um, so, so what is a ceramic? Well, a ceramic is uh, many different things to many different people. One of the simpler explanations it is a combination, it's a compound of a metal and a non-metal. Non-metal are the ones that I've boxed up here. They want to accept electrons. So if you combine an element that wants to give up an electron and an element that wants to uh, accept an electron, you create a, a strong bond, and that is the basics of creating a ceramic material. These are hard, rigid, non-conductive, non-reactive materials. 
Uh, this is what one looks like in a, in a HIP product. Uh, they tend to be aluminum oxide for, for, for HIPs. Um, and one of the nice things about them is that they uh, are very wettable. Fluids tend to spread on the surface and give you good lubrication. The surfaces stay smooth, so with low friction you get less wear of the polyethylene. They are uh, very difficult to make. You create a, a slurry from powder, you compress it, and then you have to bake it. And that's pretty much uh, another definition of ceramics is that they're formed by baking. Uh, and they can be very hard, but as you can see, occasionally they will chip, they will break, they are brittle, and when you're trying to create something as complex a geometry as a knee femoral component, uh, ceramics do not like these uh, sharp corners and uh, complex geometries. Very uh, difficult to make and very expensive. Now, one way to get around that is to put a ceramic on top of the metal to coat it. And so what you end up is depositing a ceramic on the surface and you create a new surface. Uh, problems with this is that these tend not to be very homogeneous. They're not very uniform. They're line of sight. They're difficult to put on a complex geometry. And they also tend to wear off because they lay down parallel to the surface and they tend to rub away even with articulation with polyethylene. And you can see that that can have some uh, unfortunate uh, impact on uh, the, the polyethylene wear. Uh, these are not used in very large numbers anywhere in the world. There are a few of them out there, uh, but they are not in routine use. We developed oxidized zirconium. We're taking a metal with a little bit of niobium uh, added to the zirconium to get strength by the difference in the atomic size. And then we take that metal, and we bake it, oops, we bake it in air Oxygen diffuses into the surface, as it will with all metals, and that oxygen enters into the crystal structure and hardens it. But we don't stop there. We take it all the way to saturation, and we continue to have oxygen diffuse into the surface, and that causes the metal to transform into a ceramic. It goes from zirconium metal to zirconium plus oxygen, also known as zirconium oxide. Phase transformations, a couple of quick uh, analogies. One is an icy pond. Icy pond is all water, but the surface is solid and underneath it's liquid, but it's all H2O. This is all zirconium. The surface happens to be ceramic and the interior tends to be metal. Another analogy is baking bread. You take dough, you put it in an oven, the surface caramelizes to a crust and the inside stays porous and soft, but it's all bread. It all comes from the same dough. So that's what we have here. After the oxidation process is done, we have a surface, which is a ceramic. But if you cut it in two, all you see is metal. And we've only got about five microns, five micrometers of oxide on the surface. It's enough for this to behave as a ceramic in terms of wear with the polyethylene. But mechanically, it's going to behave as the metal core does. And this is very unusual material because um, Mechanically, it's going to flex and bend as a metal flexes and bends, but it's not going to cause the oxide to peel and chip away like maybe iron oxide does off of a steel bar when it gets rusty. You start bending it, it's going to peel and flake. The oxide stays very well adhered. And here we have a head that's been crushed under 10 tons. Now, this isn't going to happen in a real body. Uh, we don't have 10 ton patients. Some of them are large, but not that big. And so this isn't going to happen, but it shows that it isn't going to fracture into pieces and the oxide's not going to come off of the surface. So it's very damage tolerant. Now that hard surface extends all the way through the oxide. It's over twice as hard as the cobalt chrome, so it resists scratching. Uh, and then we have this diffusion zone underneath, which allows the oxide to remain very well attached to the metal. If we rub it with a very strong abrasive like bone cement, over 4,900 times difference in material loss between cobalt chrome and oxinium, as you can see here, the amount of debris is much less, 160 times uh, uh, difference in roughness of these materials as well. So it's a very durable structure. Uh, the first oxinium knee was implanted in December of 1997. We have over 800,000 of them implanted at this point. 
Total knees, October 2002, over 420,000 of those implanted as of the end of the year. And thank you. Um, and you can see there are a number of reports of those outcomes in the literature. Seven registries at different nations around the world are tracking the difference between ceramics, metals, and auxinium. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, a, a breakdown here of what types of components are currently coded, and some of them are much less than the 10% of the industry that we believe is currently using oxidized zirconium. So it's a large section of the population. This is what we're proposing, is to add a new uh, category under HIPS for oxinium on polyethylene and add an oxinium on polyethylene under knees as well. And the benefits would be that it improves the specificity uh, by creating these device codes, allows us to track them, removes the burden of confusion from the uh, coders, to understand how to code them properly. And it is consistent with the underlying policy rationale for implementing the coding system in the first place. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any clinical questions? And if so, you need to come to the uh, microphone. And if not, I'll just go ahead and walk through the uh, coding options, which should be up in a moment. And these are for option for topic two. And while they're coming up, and looks like they're here now. And they're not appearing on my uh, screen, but that's okay. Let's see if I can, there we go. Okay, as you all know, the current coding is that there are, there are uh, a variety of coding um, bearing surfaces for the hips, as you'll see on this slide. The, the four types that we have. There is not bearing surface uh, detail for the knee. We only have the synthetic substitute. So to code these, we say currently you would go to the hip joint procedures and for the ceramic on polyethylene, you would use the um, ceramic on polyethylene for this, the, um, for this oxidized zirconium one. So that's current coding. For the knee, you would use the uh, J synthetic substitute. That's current. Option one is that we wouldn't create any new codes. We would continue reporting what we have now with the bearing surface detail on the hips, not adding anything to the knee, and not adding detail for the oxidized zirconium. Option two is that we would add the detail of oxidized zirconium to the hips and knee by applying it to total hip and knee joints as you see on this chart. So we would add that one piece of information. Option three is that we would, and let me just show you the option, it may be help a little bit to see. You see we would add the detail for the type of bearing surfaces to the knee and we would also add we would add the detail for, for the knee, as shown here. Option four is that we would apply the detail for the oxidized zirconium to the knee joint. It may be easier to show. We would put in the detail of the oxidized zirconium for the hip and joint. You can see the visual here. We would add detail for the four bearing surfaces to the knee joint, as shown here, and we would also add detail for the oxidized zirconium. CMS's recommendation is option three. We would apply the bearing surface detail that's present on the hip now to the knees, and we would not add detail for oxidized zirconium, 
and we would let people continue to report that under the ceramic on polyethylene. And we wouldn't create any codes for this one. And in the meantime, you would continue to use the uh, current codes as described. Does anybody have any comments or questions on that? And please come to the microphone. Hi, Pat. <clears throat> My name is Gail Jobbert, and I'm an attorney with Reed Smith and a nurse. And I used to do orthopedic procedures and hip and knee replacement surgery at Northwestern, and so this is a topic near and dear to my heart and work with a lot of companies in this space. So <clears throat> just a couple of um, points. Uh, one, as far as option three goes, where you have add unicondular to the device uh, code section, my thought would be that that would be added as part of the body part description. So it'd be left or right knee comma unicondular because that would be describing the area of the body that was being worked on. And then in the device section, you would keep whatever device codes or values that you decided to add. <clears throat> if you add unicondular to the device component, then you're left without knowing what kind of implant was put in there other than unicondylar. I, I should stop you there now because the unicondylar was part of the things that's been approved so far that we just mentioned earlier today as a code type. So if you could restrict your comments to additional new things, that would be helpful and we'll look forward to getting these in writing. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> and the other uh, comment is that on the recommendation to move the uh, existing device types from hip to knee. Uh, there, to my knowledge, and, and I think I know this area pretty well, there are no ceramic or ceramic on ceramic knee implants um, that are out there. I mean, they, it would, those would not necessarily work, nor are there metal on metal. There's metal on polyurethane, um, but, but no metal on metal implants for knees nor ceramic on ceramic implants for knees. And finally, <clears throat> I think as you've looked at the data and how these procedures are currently being coded, I think that adding zirconium would be very helpful. Um, you know, CJR is being implemented next month, and I think that it will be very critical for hospitals to be able to uh, appropriately track the types of implants that are being used and then correlate that with outcomes and readmissions and, and uh, adverse events. And the more data that hospitals have with respect to that, the better they'll be able to manage their, their uh, resources and improve quality of care based on the outcomes that they're seeing for those particular patients. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to getting all those comments in writing. And we have another comment. Hi. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Scott Reed, Smith and & Nephew. And so I'd like to speak in favor of the uh, coding application request uh, that Dr. Hunter just covered. Um, basically, I think that there's a, a number of strong reasons for creating these new codes, in particular with the ICD-10 system, obviously much more granularity. And as you alluded to earlier, there are certainly some codes for fairly obscure situations. Um, we think that it would be important to create a new code that would basically apply potentially 90 to 100,000 times per year. Uh, roughly about 1 million total joint replacements occur annually. This is in the neighborhood of about 10%, so this would definitely create much more uh, precision when it comes to tracking those types of implants. Um, I think that we're also kind of saw a Wall Street Journal article about a week or two ago on big data. Lots of different data sets are coming together. Uh, this is all allowing us to basically track longitudinally patients that have different types of services, different types of treatments, and I think that this would enable CMS to basically look down the road and see what types of uh, outcomes are associated with different types of implants. Um, and I would also say that, uh, you know, we appreciate that in option three, the uh, preliminary option from CMS, certainly you added some specificity to the knee side. However, we would say that the three of the four codes as proposed by CMS almost never apply or do not apply at all. The ceramic on ceramic, ceramic on poly, uh, we would instead prefer that you uh, add this one, oxidized zirconium, because this actually does represent a meaningful uh, type of uh, implant that is out there. 
And um, we also think that there are some payers out there that are differentiating this particular type of implant from others, and it would certainly help them in terms of their claims processing and coverage policies. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we look forward to getting all of your additional comments on this issue. Maddie, are you ready? I'm going to introduce Maddie Hughes now, who will be doing our first topic. Good morning. We're now on page 12, if you're following along in the handouts, and we'll be discussing the spy fluorescence vascular angiography topic. The issue is that currently within ICD-10 PCS, there are not unique values to describe the use of intraoperative FVA. So we'll talk about whether new codes should be created. At this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Zinn, Chief Medical Officer of NIVADAC. Thank you, Maddie. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Zen, and I'm a professor of surgery at Duke University and also the CMO for Novadac, the maker of the SPI system. And we're talking about fluorescence vascular angiography. And certainly, uh, angiography has changed significantly over time. Uh, way back, angiography would involve radiation and dangerous dyes, and these procedures generally needed to happen before the surgery at a different location. And we evolved to a point now where surgeons can use angiography in the operating room themselves and control it without dangerous dyes and without radiation. So they're really completely different uh, technologies. And this is a busy slide, but basically saying that the differences between the two, when you're using radiation, you need protective gear, you need to wear lead, you need to uh, use dyes that potentially could be injur injurious to kidneys because the dye is cleared by kidneys, versus uh, the laser angiography we're talking about with fluorescence, where the dye is not harmful to the kidneys, in fact, cleared by the liver. Uh, it's a class two uh, camera, infrared camera, so you don't need any special uh, safety goggles, don't need any special uh, devices for safety. And again, is used by surgeons, and not just to identify the anatomy, but also to see actual perfusion in tissue, uh, which is something that angiography has never done before. So here's a, some of the platforms that we have uh, in place right now. Uh, we can actually look at arterial inflow and venous outflow. Uh, we can actually look at perfusion. In this picture here, uh, you can see actually the bowel will light up where there is blood flow uh, and where there's not. Uh, interestingly, when this dye ICG is injected into tumors, the dye gets taken up by lymphatics, and so it's currently also being used now to look at lymph nodes and sentinel lymph node harvest. And finally, when the dye is not being cleared by uh, renal devices or renal excretion, it's being cleared by the liver. So interestingly, this dye gets concentrated in the bile and is being used in the biliary system for identifying key structures. So it's a very interesting molecule and is used in many ways. The actual technique itself, it's simple for surgeons to use in the OR because it's simply an intravenous injection of the dye and turning on this camera, which is a infrared camera that excites the dye and you see fluorescence wherever there's blood flow. The dye itself has actually been around for a very long time, introduced in the 1970s, so the safety profile has been well documented. The beauty of this dye, uh, because it's bound to the albumin, it goes where blood goes, and then will go into tissues and then leave tissues. So within three minutes, the dye is completely gone. And in my procedures and procedures that are being used, you can use it over and over again, which is very different than dyes of the past. So here's an example of one of my patients. So I'm using the lower abdominal tissues to build a breast in breast reconstruction. Now normally, to tell where there's good blood supply in this tissue, I'll use my clinical judgment, which is, which is hard to know where there's good blood supply or not. We're often misled. Uh, tissues can bleed and look okay. Interestingly, when you look at this tissue using spies, so with injection and then the infrared camera, it suddenly becomes very obvious where there's good perfusion and where there's not. And I would say anybody in the audience would be able to tell me where the perfusion is good and not. It's interesting that the dark areas, when you actually look at them clinically, look normal and they'll bleed normally. But when initial, our initial experience was to leave those areas alone and what would happen is we'd see skin loss, fat loss, and actual tissue loss that required reoperative surgery. We don't have those problems anymore because we'll remove all these dark areas before we actually do the reconstruction. And there's also a software package that comes with this technology that helps to evaluate these black and white images and give you a number. And that number has been shown in studies to be valuable for predicting when skin or when tissue might die, and, uh, which again adds value. 
So you can imagine if you can limit complications and you can limit tissue death or skin loss or other complications, you're going to save money. And so uh, there have been many reports in the literature now showing the cost utility of using this technology and its cost effectiveness. Let me show you another example. Uh, it's very common nowadays for women who are having a mastectomy, so removal of the breast for cancer, to save the actual skin in the nipple. There's no breast tissue uh, in the skin itself. It adds to better cosmesis. The problem is the blood supply of the skin comes from the breast. By doing the mastectomy, suddenly the skin doesn't have good blood supply, and our clinical judgment is just not very good. We can look at skin, it looks fine, but the incidence of actual nipple and skin loss is as high as 40% in, in studies. We can use this technology, and you see the images portrayed here, and we can actually see good flow in the brighter colors, but poor flow in these blue colors. And in fact, this area of blue is telling me this is an area that doesn't have good blood supply. It's going to go on and have a problem if you're not careful. And in this particular case, uh, we uh, didn't pay attention to this, and we said, well, the skin looks good. Let's go ahead. And what you see afterwards post-op is exactly where the nipple was lost and exactly where the skin is lost is where SPI predicted it. And so this predictive value is incredible. So I actually, we don't have these problems anymore because when SPI tells us there's a problem with the skin, we don't go on and do that reconstruction. We change our plan and limit necrosis. And there have been study after study now proving this and showing it even in blinded fashion that this technology is very predictive and very helpful uh, in these types of cases. And so these are the normal results that we see now. Here's a patient of mine. Her left breast is going to be removed for mastectomy. She has a very large skin envelope, which puts her at high risk for losing skin and losing her nipple because the spy image tells me that the blood supply is good during my reconstruction. She can wake up with a completed reconstruction, as you see here. And these results are incredibly beautiful and natural compared to the results that we used to put tissue expanders, go through months of expansion, put final implants in. Another patient here with a D-cup breast, we would have never even considered a patient like this because the skin envelope is just too big and the chances of living the nipple are too high, but using SPI, I safely was able to do a bilateral reconstruction with beautiful results. Obviously better for patients, but think about now, we're also doing in one operation what used to take multiple operations and multiple office visits, so there's a great cost savings here as well. It's not just in uh, plastic surgery, certainly other areas. If you take, I mentioned that the dye is concentrated in the bile, so gallbladder surgery, the incidence of injuring the bile duct or common bile duct is a huge problem. If there's uh, a complication there, the surgery that's needed, this becomes one of these outliers that are very expensive. You can use this to look at the biliary system and actually see the duct during surgery and protect it. We've shown also in colon resections and bowel resections that this technology is great for looking at bowel and seeing where there's good blood supply and not. If you put two pieces of bowel together in an area where there's poor blood supply, you're actually going to see a leak, you'll see a healing issue, and studies have shown you can greatly diminish this complication by using this technology. And obviously in wounds and vascular applications where you're looking at blood supply, this is going to be very helpful. And these complications matter. These are the outliers. These are the patients who have a complication and suddenly that average cost of a procedure shoots up because now uh, they need more surgery and longer hospitalizations. So these are real dollars. And if we look at some of just these simple uh, procedures, whether it's gallbladder surgery, colon surgery, wound surgery, the 30-day readmission rates are real. Most of these complications are related to blood supply. And that's the beauty of this technology. The amount of money and the amount of potential savings we're talking about really is in the billions of dollars. So we've talked about breast reconstruction, colon surgery, it's used in head and neck surgery, vascular surgery. Really, most areas of surgery that have a complication are starting to use this technology and see that this is related to perfusion. Now, Novodak has had 510K clearance since 2005, and what we see in 2015 and 2016 is now there are many companies that are entering into this uh, field because it's been proven, and it's actually something that's here to stay. And so this is not just Novodak, this is really for the benefit of companies that are going to be using this technology. Uh, the applications continue to grow, and uh, this is a good thing, I think. This is uh, helping limit complications and is better for our patients. And certainly from Novodak's standpoint, there's plenty, of artery, uh, there's plenty of support in the literature. The number of procedures is over 200,000 at this point, and there are many systems in place. And if you look at the potential market, it's actually a large market. These are not necessarily everybody having surgery, but who are the complicated patients who are going to have the complications, apply this technology, and the amount of impact you can make is quite large. And so this, looking at Novodak's numbers itself, in 2015, you see about 40,000 procedures, but this is the prediction now that the procedure, now that's being used more and more and that more and more centers have this, this is a code that's going to be used frequently. And again, this is just Novodak's numbers. Other companies will certainly add to these numbers as well. 
Uh, there is a value proposition here. If you look at just almost every study that has looked at comparing with and without this technology, complication rates that can be as high as the 20 percentile are dropped down to the single digits, and which is obviously great for patients as far as morbidity uh, from surgery. So what is the issue? The issue is that this uh, technology used to have its own code in ICD-9, uh, initially for cardiac surgery, then liberalized to other areas of the body. And in the crosswalk, uh, this has now been lumped with ionizing radiation. And hopefully I've shown you that this is really not appropriate. It's a completely different technology. To have its own codes would be important, not only uh, for being correct in identifying what was being done, but also then following this technology and seeing how it's helpful and actually proving its value, uh, which we feel strongly about. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any clinical questions for Dr. Zen? <clears throat> no? Okay, while well, we wait for the coding option slides to come up, we're on page 13 of the handouts. And Current coding for this type of technology would be coded to table 3E0, and that's introduction of other diagnostic substance into peripheral vein percutaneous approach or the introduction of other diagnostic substance into central vein with a percutaneous approach. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. Coding option one would be not to assign a separate code for the intraoperative FVA equipment that's used to assess vascular perfusion during any type of those surgeries. <clears throat> Coding option two would be to create unique codes to capture the use of intraoperative FVA during various types of procedures. <clears throat> we would create a new function value S for vascular perfusion and it would be in table 4A1 for measurement and monitoring. And we would use the existing fourth character values to describe the various body parts. Coding option three would be to create a new qualifier value of V for indesigning green dye in table 3EO of the administration section. And it would be applied to the six character substance value other diagnostic substance for the vein body part values. In the handouts, there is an option four. It's not going to be in the slides, but option four is to implement both options two and three. So it would be to have a code in the measurement and monitoring section as well as the administration section. And CMS is recommending option four to have both options two and three. Do we have any comments or questions? Please state your name when you come to the mic. Hi, I'm Linda Holtzman from Clarity Coding. Um, this may be a, both a clinical question and a coding question. Um, I, I'd like to note that I have no objection at all to creating distinct values for this. Uh, we had distinct uh, codes in ICD-9, and they were fine. And I can certainly see why you'd want to have unique uh, values in ICD-10. So, so far, so good. Um, the issue for me is that I'm not sure this is quite the way to go about it. I'm not sure if I'm just not understanding it because I'm you know, just seeing it now. But it, it, seems, it seems a little overly complicated, the, the options, which I realize is a hilarious statement in a coding system that has 70,000 codes and is about to get 3,500 more. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is an imaging modality, yes? Yes. So I'm not sure why this wouldn't be better somewhere in section B, if there's some other way to, to, to do it, to, to add values or another table to section B or something like that, rather than having separate uh, codes in section four and section three or whatever it is, and then trying to put all those together to, to show what this is. So I, I think maybe, have, I haven't had a chance to think it through, but it, it may be better to, to look back at, at section B, unless you've already done that and decided that it you know, didn't, didn't work there. Yeah, we, we did take a look at that, and the requester did as well. So it's not that it's totally off the table, but after further discussions, we decided to move forward with these proposals <clears throat> that we're discussing today. Well, I'll think it through, but at this, at this point, it, it seems to me like the natural place for me to look for this is Section B, and I would have trouble finding it elsewhere, especially it, it, finding two codes elsewhere. It is a, it is a procedure that the surgeon's performing, though. It's not 
you know, there are other categories to me and to my mind, and if anybody else would like to speak up, you know, it's not being done by some radiologist somewhere else and, and is, so it is imaging, but it is, a, it is actually something that we're doing in the operating room It's not, not really well. an issue of, of who is performing it. That, that yeah. might be more of a CPT type issue. But in, in ICD-10, uh, it's really more an issue of what is being done. So, you know, since it's, since it's an imaging modality, I, I would just think to look in section B. Yeah. It, 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 it yeah. may be that, that, that this works, it's just, it's, it's not intuitive, is, is my point, at yeah. least from a coding perspective. Yeah, thanks, Lena. I think um, one of the considerations we have to review is what would be most useful from a data standpoint. And, and that's kind of the approach that um, we, we took with this. But, you know, we're always willing to take your comments. <laughs> Nellie Lee on Chisane American Hospital Association. I have to admit that I've, I'm also wearing my coder's hat, and so I was having trouble with the term angiography and going to two different root operations that one was saying, okay, how, how are you administering um, the uh, substance, which when you code angiographies for other things, we don't code that separately, so that was number one. And number two, I was, it was, a, quite a stretch for me to think of this procedure as being monitoring. Um, and I understand, you know, from a surgeon's perspective, what are they doing, why they're doing this, but it just didn't seem to fit together for me that something that would be called vascular angiography would end up in a monitoring root operation. So again, I, I'm not sure, you know, how we get around that, but, and obviously would create a lot more new codes if we would put it into the imaging section. But I think for coder, you know, we, we finally learned how to use the root operations. I would just be thrown for a loop to say, this is monitoring, really? Thank you. Thank you, Nellie. <clears throat> Are there any other questions or comments? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, for interim coding, can't forget that. Um, you would code as it is under current coding. You would just code the administration. Thank you. We're now going to turn to topic three, spinal fusion with nano texture surface, and that'll be on page 20 through 23, and we'll ask Michelle Joshua to come up front. And you will all recognize this new lovely face as someone who has not presented before. We are thrilled to have on the MSDRG and coding team, Michelle, who is a clinical nurse with a lot of experience in clinical practice, uh, quality issues, and, and the likes in the hospitals. So she comes fresh from the hospital setting to help us. She also works on the new technology team. And so today, in a, all of her topics will be new technology requests for new codes. And so and Michelle is now going to cover the next two topics, topic three and four, and we'll let her introduce the topic and the speaker and remind everyone about our 10-minute clinical presentation limit. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Pat. Our agenda item number three is spinal fusion with nanotextured surfaces. The issue today for this agenda item there's not a unique ICD-10 PCS device value to describe an interbody fusion device using nanotextured surfaces for spinal fusion procedures. So the issue we'll discuss today is if there should be a new device value procedure code added. Here to discuss the clinical aspects of nanotextured surfaces is Mr. Jeff Dunkel from Titan Spine. Welcome, Jeff. Is this my clicker? It's still coming up. Okay. But when it does come up, you'll hit this button. Excellent. While we're waiting on the uh, slides to pull up, I'd like to just take a, a brief second to thank uh, CMS for creating an avenue that allows uh, those of us who are uh, trying to be innovative in the medical community uh, to bring forward new technologies and to make sure that we have the opportunity to present both the clinical, uh, procedural, et cetera, 
uh, opportunities to advance patient care. Uh, so on behalf of those of us in the room that work on the industry side, we do appreciate your efforts uh, moving forward and now. We apologize, they're working on having this slide found and brought up. It'll be just a moment. So unrelated to the presentation, I did just have two cups of coffee to ensure my 10 minute speech hits 10 minutes. <laughs> If I talk too fast, you guys just raise your hand and let me know. Ms. Joshua? We apologize, but they're having some trouble getting these slides to work. So if you don't mind, if uh, maybe we can go to the next topic. Sure. I think we'll find those quicker and give them a little extra time. So we're approved? <laughs> You're on the fast track. Okay, Michelle, if you don't mind, you'll come out and we'll go to topic four, which is on page 24 through 26, and we'll start with that topic while we work out the other slides. Okay, good morning again. We will be discussing the next topic, which is intravenous administration of Andexin at Alpha. Oh, you are here, great. Okay, great. And the issue here is there is no ICD-10 PCS code for the intravenous administration of Andexin at Alpha which is a recombinant modified and truncated human factor 10A protein that serves as a universal antidote to direct factor A inhibitors. And today to present the clinical aspects of andexanate alpha is Dr. Rishi Anand. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Good evening, good morning. So we're here to talk about andexanate alpha, which is a recombinant human protein used in the treatment of patients with acute major bleeding coming in on factor 10A inhibitors. Uh, andexanate alpha is the first in-class universal antidote for patients who are coming in on factor 10A drugs. It will be indicated for patients on oral factor 10A inhibitors who suffered a major bleeding episode and require urgent reversal. Currently, there are no factor 10A antidotes available. We are looking forward to an expected Food and Drug Administration approval in 2016 with breakthrough therapy designation. It's currently given as an IV administration as a bolus followed thereafter by an infusion and reversal of anticoagulation effect usually occurs within two to five minutes. And Dexanate Alpha will be the first and only antidote available for factor 10A inhibitors. For those of us 
Factor 10 inhibitors are typically medications such as uh, Seralta or Rivaroxaban, Cervesa, uh, and Eliquis. So it's a request for a unique code uh, in the ICD-10 system. As a background, we have submitted a biologic license application uh, for Index and an Alpha under the accelerated approval pathway. There's, we're looking forward to an approval in mid-2016, and, and Dexanet Alpha has received breakthrough therapy designation as well as orphan drug designation. The current issue is that the ICD-10 system does not describe IV infusion of recombinant, inactive, and truncated factor 10A, otherwise known as factor 10A, or otherwise known as Dexanet Alpha. A new technology application has been submitted for Andexanet Alpha for fiscal year 2017. And Andexanet Alpha is not identified by any existing ICD-10 code. A unique ICD-10 code will help facilitate claims processing as well as payment adjustments for the new technology add-on payments. So as a way of background, uh, Andexanet Alpha is obviously utilized for patients who are on factor 10A inhibitors suffering major bleeding events. Well, who are these patients? Uh, there's a wide swath of patients with clinical indications. Patients who have uh, atrial fibrillation and are at risk for a stroke are indicated for a factor 10A inhibitor, such as Xarelto or Eliquis or Cervesa. Uh, patients who have suffered a blood clot in the leg or a deep vein thrombosis and now have a blood clot that traveled to the lung or a pulmonary embolism are also indicated for these medications. We also utilize factor 10A inhibitors in the prevention or recurrence of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So patients receiving Andexanet Alpha can come from a multitude of underlying medical conditions and therefore may be assigned to a variety of MSDRG payments as a way of background. In terms of defining the scope of the problem and the burden, atrial fibrillation and venous thromboembolism patients are at high risk for thrombotic events and therefore require chronic anticoagulation utilization. AFib burden of disease in the United States alone affects approximately 3 to 6 million people every year. It contributes to about 130,000 deaths each year and costs the U.S. an annualized amount of approximately $6 billion. Patients with AF do have an increased risk of stroke, and AF is the cause of at least 15 to 20 percent of ischemic strokes. When you switch gears and you look at the people who have blood clots, uh, every year there are an estimated 10 million cases of venothromboembolism worldwide. In the U.S., there are about 100 to 300,000 VTE-related deaths every year mainly affecting our aging population, approximately 8 per thousand, uh, aged 80 and older. So to prevent thrombosis, obviously these patients require anticoagulant therapy. Well, a little bit about the factor 10A inhibitors. They are a new class of anticoagulant. Apixaban or rivaroxaban and endoxaban directly inhibit factor 10A to prevent coagulation. Factor 10A inhibitors do have an associated risk of bleeding complications. The Dresden Registry, as we looked at, um, let's see if this portal works. The Dresden Registry tracked approximately, uh, tracked patients on factor 10A inhibitors, specifically rivaroxaban, and monitored their outcome for bleeding episodes. Major bleeding events resulted in about a 5.1% mortality rate. And Dexanet Alpha rapidly reverses factor 10A inhibitor activity, enabling restoration of coagulation to establish hemostasis. Actor and Dexanet Alpha will be the only uh, uh, therapy available to reverse all factor 10A uh, inhibitors. So currently, what are the options that are available in clinical care for patients who come in with bleeding events? Well, we can obviously stop the bleeding. Uh, we can stop the use of the anticoagulant. Life-threatening bleeds do require urgent reversal, but just simply stopping it causes us to delay treatment and patient stabilization and that in itself is associated with complications. We can try to give fresh frozen plasma, FFP, uh, for those of you who may recall, is a fluid portion of human blood and contains naturally occurring coagulation factors. We could also try PCC or recombinant factor 7A. Prothrombin complex concentrate and recombinant factor or activated factor 7A are enriched coagulation factors. They are purified from the serum of human donors. I'd like to point out that Andexanet Alpha is not a functional coagulation factor and it is not a purified human plasma, further differentiating this molecule from available treatment options. So Andexanet Alpha will represent a treatment option that is currently not available in the United States. 
For patients who come in with bleeding events on warfarin or Coumadin, we could perhaps give them vitamin K or four-factor PCC. It's already available. For patients who come in on direct thrombin inhibitors, such as uh, dabigatran, there is an available reversal agent for them as well. But for those patients who are the overwhelming majority uh, who come in with factor 10A inhibitor-associated bleeds, there is currently no approved antidote for these patients. Patients on factor 10A inhibitors suffer from life-threatening bleeds and have no approved reversal agent to date. A little bit about the molecule itself. Um, and dexin alpha has been designed to look as a decoy for factor 10A, but with some critical modulations. First of all, there, this, port, this is the factor 10A molecule itself, which is active in the coagulation cascade. We've removed the portion, it's called the GLA domain, which has been removed to prevent an anticoagulant effect. Secondly, there's been a change of a single amino acid from serine to alanine, which makes the um, which makes the decoy no longer have a catalytic effect and therefore prevents a coagulation effect. And finally, andexin and alpha directly binds factor 10A inhibitors, reducing their activity. In terms of uh, clinical trial data, what we've seen in phase three published data in the New England Journal is when you administer andexin and alpha, what happens to the anti-factor 10A levels in subjects? So, in this slide over here, these are patients who are receiving a Pixaban. They received a bolus followed by an infusion, and what you see is a rapid reversal of anti-factor 10A levels with a sustained maintenance of the reversal of the anti-factor 10A activity. This is both consistent with patients on Ampixaban as well as patients on Rivaroxaban. The study was published in the New England Journal and demonstrated that andexin and alpha rapidly reduces anti-factor 10A activity, resulting in improved hemostasis. With respect to thrombin generation, which is also critical to restoring a, no a normal coagulation cascade, we see the following. In patients who are on ampixaban, and after you give an IV bolus followed by an infusion, you see a rapid restoration or rapid normalization of thrombin generation that persists over time. Similarly, in patients who are on rivaroxaban, after a IV bolus and infusion, you see a rapid normalization of thrombin generation, which persists over time in the normal ranges. Therefore, in the New England Journal, we found and published that andexin and alpha helps to normalize thrombin generation activity. So, a little bit about the molecule in terms of uh, logistics. Andexin alpha is typically administered in an inpatient setting. Uh, the dose is dependent upon the specific factor 10A inhibitor that the patient is taking at home. In terms of supply, it's going to be utilized as a single-use vial containing 100 milligrams of andexin and alpha in a sterile white to off-white powder or cake form uh, without the accompanying solution for reconstitution. At the hospital setting, uh, in terms of administration, andexin and alpha would be administered as an IV bolus plus infusion after reconstitution. And in terms of setting, andexin and alpha will be administered in the inpatient hospital setting, typically in the emergency room. In terms of code, um, a unique code for the andexin and alpha should be considered and included in the ICD-10 system. It's a novel treatment for re reversal of factor 10A inhibition in patients experiencing a major bleeding event. Portola has submitted a BLA application and looks forward to an approval by mid-2016. Current codes in the ICD-10 system do not describe andexin and alpha administration, and inclusion of unique code will help and assist with diagnostic, billing, and reporting purposes. The unique code accurately identifies andexin and alpha, will also help facilitate claims for providers. Thank you very much. Are there any clinical questions for Dr. Anand? Thank you. Okay, so we'll go to the coding options at this time. Is he gonna load it? Okay, great.
current coding for Andexanet Alpha would be the administration that can be reported using codes from table 3EO. Coding option one would be to use the codes, the current codes from table 3EO and not to create new codes for Andexanet Alpha. Coding option two would be to capture the IV administration of Andexanet Alpha, create a new qualifier value using table 3EO by adding qualifier E Andexanet Alpha. Coding option three would be to create a new technology code in the X section of ICD-10 PCS to capture the intravenous administration of Andexanet Alpha. CMS recommends option three, the new technology code using section X. Interim coding advice would be to continue using codes from table 3EO for the intravenous administration of Andexanet Alpha. Are there any coding questions at this time? Great, thank you. Oh, Linda has a question. Actually, it's just a comment. A comment. Um, I'd like to comment that I, I agree with CMS. Which Thank you. <laughs> um, I, guess, I guess that's noteworthy. Um, I, I agree with it because I think this is a, a very proper use of Section X for uh, this type of new technology, technology drug. So I like, I like putting it in Section X. Thank you for your comment. Okay, we'll call Pat Brooks for the next agenda. Okay, so we'll go back to Titan Spine, fabulous. Okay. All right, so let's try this again. This agenda item is spinal fusion with nano textured surfaces and the issue is there are currently no ICD-10 PCS codes currently used to describe nanotextured surfaces. Here to describe the clinical aspects of this new technology is Mr. Jeff Dunkel from Titan Spine. Welcome again, Jeff. Okay, so thanks again. Here's the good news. While we're talking about first, I think this is probably the first encore presentation in the history of CMS. <laughs> um, what we wanna talk about today is, uh, is the application of nanolock technology. We hear a lot in the industry about surfaces, the type of materials used. What Titan Spine has done that's unique is created a certain surface topography that can actually interact and talk to the body. Uh, and so our request is to use this new form of technology that's been validated and approved by the FDA and make sure that that gets passed on so that hospitals have access to this for patient care. Uh, we did a presentation on the new technology town hall in February, so we're gonna to try to limit the clinical, make sure we hit our 10 minute mark, and get through our, uh, our patient population procedure, significant differences, outcomes, and approvals. And then whatever questions you guys have. So in the US population, you guys can go on Google and pull up, there's a, a thousand different studies that have populated, but consistently what you will find is that the number two reason for MD visits throughout the United States is pain, right behind respiratory infection. Over six million people in the U.S. are being treated for chronic back pain, defined as lasting longer than three months with treatment, and workers missed 149 million workdays last year, accounting for about $28 billion. In the hierarchy of spinal treatment for pain, spinal fusion is near the bottom and close to what many would consider a last resort. And the thought process behind spinal fusion, which we'll discuss in a minute, is to take a collapsed or, or degenerative disc remove that disc, rebuild the height, and stabilize. That stabilization typically creates the symptomatic relief that we're looking for. What we're trying to do is do that better. In the US population, uh, February 2014, a study that was released, it was actually an evaluation of 2009 statistics, and what it showed is that CMS accounted for 37 
just over 37% of all fusions in the United States, and 41% of revisions. The reason I put this slide up is because I think it shows that there is absolutely a need to continue the improvement in this patient population. Additional CMS changes that I think are important to make note of. Historically, success in fusion has been defined by those that are above the top line. So you're looking at patient fusion, discharge, check up at 90 days. Hey, how are we doing, right? Follow up a year later. The patient is not coming in basically to say, I have, I need fusion, right? What they're asking for is symptomatic relief. And the new definitions from the Affordable Care Act and those that are put out by penalties associated with uh, value-based purchasing, HCAP scores, hospital acquired conditions, readmissions, et cetera, put an entire new group of parameters around by which we're judged in spinal fusion, specifically on outcomes prior to that first year mark. And so one of the opportunities for innovative companies like Titan Spine is to not only improve fusion, but improve the speed of fusion, improve the outcomes associated with pain relief, et cetera. What you'll find is consistency regardless of the area of body. So we're going to look at a surgical approach, primarily from a, cerv from a cervical clinical procedure for, spite tight, uh, for, for any spinal fusion. I'm seeing it an anterior approach. But as you move down the back towards lumbar, you have posterior, anterior, et cetera, lateral applications. You determine the disc uh, preparation. So do I need to take out the whole disc? Typically in the environment, the answer is yes. Once we have cleared out the disc. We're going to look at the size required for the implant to rebuild that stabilized height. And then the implant selection. And this is where Titan Spine has the opportunity to create new and novel impacts in the industry, primarily by providing an implant that has a meaningful osteogenic set. We look at differentiation. The rest of you guys can read and see the pictures. Implants. We'll talk about how that happens in fusion category. What we've seen is a progression. And that progression has also been noted throughout the history of ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. So we'll see this in just a second. But we started with bone or allograft, also autograft, transformed from there into peak polyether ether ketone, which is a medical grade plastic. Uh, we've seen a lot of momentum now in the market transitioning to rough and titanium. And, and now the new innovation, which is the introduction of the nanotextured surface that does have that cellular response that we're looking for to help the body help itself. As we progressed along this timeline, what we're looking for is the improvement uh, on healing, improvement of uh, basically all the negatives that have been potentially associated with spinal fusion, including disease transmission because allograft is a tissue, uh, and inflammatory responses associated with polyether ether ketone. The goal for, for nano lock technology is to use a combination of the material and the, the topography of that material uh, to create that surface hierarchy that the cell prefers. So let's talk about that for a second. These are a lot of uh, a, a very, very small pictures. So to put this in perspective, when we say nanotechnology and when we say we're the first company to have a nanotechnology clearance from the FDA, the sheet of paper that you're holding in your hand is 100,000 nanometers thick, okay? The ability to manufacture on a nano level is, is extremely impressive. We'll talk about all the awards, recognitions, et cetera, that Titan has gotten for their ability to produce nanolock technology. But before we do that, let's talk about what we've determined is meaningful to get your body to help heal itself from a spinal fusion standpoint and create that osteogenic cellular response. First is we want to upregulate osteoblasts. Osteoblasts uh, are the bone builders. We want to downregulate osteoclasts, which are the bone eaters. We want to upregulate angiogenesis. So from an angiogenesis standpoint, that's the growth of blood vessels from an existing um, vasculature. And then we want to reduce, recruit mesenchymal stem cells. In order to do that, we need to create a biochemical process that includes transforming growth factors, uh, bone, meta, uh, excuse me, bone morphogenic proteins, vascular endothelial growth factors, fibroblast growth factors, et cetera. What Titan has learned is that you can do that by interacting with a cell membrane. But you guys know cells are small, right? So in order to interact with a cell membrane, we have to be smaller than a cell. Standard cell that we're trying to interact with is 10 microns, okay? So we have to do three distinct things at three, to th 
three distinct levels in order to accomplish this. First, in order to get that 10 micron to sit, we have to create the osteoclastic, the Tamira and osteoclastic pit. Before we get to a cellular level, though, we have to create that, that purchase, that anti-expulsion, so that we get that initial stabilization that the body wants to help get the symptomatic relief early, okay? So we have microscale features. You'll see a lot of microscale fe features on, on most implants. Uh, ours differentiate because the device slides in easier and has more expulsion factor, but it's not the nanoscale feature that we're looking for from the indication, so I'm going to move past that. At a micro level, you want a pit that's 30 to 100 microns in diameter, roughly 14 microns deep. You want to make sure that you have skewedness, kurtosis, depth measures. There's a whole litany of what cells like effectively, right? And we have created a schedule in a manufacturing environment that allows us to effectively better Betty Crocker what the cell wants to see. More importantly, though, is the nano level feature. So this is where we're smaller than the cells. That nanoscale feature should be able to touch a cell membrane and interact with integrants, specifically alpha 2, beta 1, which sends off the messenger RNA, which then influences all of the areas that upregulate osteoblast, downregulate osteoclast, upregulate angiogenesis, and recruit those mesenchymal stem cells. So in the pictures that we saw before, even at 100,000 times magnification, you still can't see a nano level. So what we have to look at is, uh, excuse me, what we have to look at is uh, an optical profilometry image, and that's what you see in the middle. To the far left is the Titan Spine Current product, which is considered the leader from a, from a macro, micro, nano scale in the environment right now. What Titan Spine has done is worked for six years and 35 different attempts to create an optimal nano surface. That nano surface, which you see in the middle, now improves the nanoscale features. So this is on a z-axis. It's looking at the height of the features that will touch that cell membrane and interact with those integrants. And for this reason, the FDA gave Titan Spine the first ever clearance that features nanotechnology. So what we're hoping is that the FDA and that clearance is then followed and creates a path for other spinal fusion companies to walk down should they have the ability to manufacture on a consistent basis like Titan Spine. The very last picture, what you're seeing is the interaction of an osteoblast. In a non-scientific term, this is a very, very happy osteoblast setting up to build bone, and that's what we want. And it's mimicked the osteoclastic pit, so it knows where to go. That pit is signaling where does the cell need to go to build bone. In the clinical presentation from February uh, 16th, we talked about what, was, what has been noted over several years and what we now know to be true, and that is that that ability to create that meaningful osteogenic cellular response does improve fusion, especially, uh, especially the speed of fusion. It does decrease pain, greater stability, quicker recovery time, and lower device-related complications, not just measured by Titan Spine, but by one of the largest insurance companies in the United States in a third-party retrospective evaluation. This science has been recognized in 11 peer-reviewed science journals. It was mentioned, the only medical company mentioned at the White House Office of Science and Technology National Nanotechnology Initiative at the Presidential Council for this last year. It's won award after award at the largest and most recognized uh, uh, meetings in the spinal fusion community. So in summary, we believe that the Nanolock technology has demonstrated the clinical improvement. It meets the quality for newness criteria, significantly differentiates in its manufacturing process and in its FDA clearances. And then finally, through this presentation, uh, offers the procedural differentiation that is not there, which justifies the, uh, the addition of a new code. So what we are asking again is for the interbody fusion device nanotextured surface um, with, with one caveat that we have to make sure in the current coding system we separate cervical and lumbar, so we have to make sure that we still have that distinction. Uh, so this, there, there may need to be uh, continued conversations moving forward. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay here for a second. Sure. Are there any questions for Mr. Dunko? Clinical questions. Okay, we'll move on to the coding options. Thank you. Yep. 
Okay, current coding options for interbody spinal fusion with nanotextured surfaces would include coding options from tables ORG and OSG. These are um, fusion operations for both cervical and thoracic. To include lumbar as well. Coding option one would be not to create new ICD-10 PCS codes and to continue using the coding options in tables ORG and OSG as described. Coding option two would be to create new device value interbody fusion device nanotextured surfaces for spinal joint body part values in those same tables and identifying spinal fusion procedures that use a nanotextured interbody fusion device. Coding option three, as this is a new technology, would be to create a new technology code in section X to identify spinal fusion procedures that use a nanotextured interbody fusion device, use the same spinal joint body part values as in the body system's upper joints and lower joints of the med surge sections. And this is coding option four. Create new codes in section X, again a new technology code to identify spinal fusion procedures that use a nanotextured inner body fusion device. Create a streamlined spinal joint body parts value in the new technology section for simplified coding and data collection for this new technology. At this time, CMS recommends option four creating the new code in section X, new technology with a streamlined approach. For interim coding device, we would continue to use the coding sections from table o, tables ORG and OSG. Are there any coding questions at this time? Sue Bowman with the American Health Information Management Association. One question and a, and a comment. One question, I don't know if it's coding or clinical, but I'm wondering if the use of this service is going to be, uh, of this surface, is going to be routinely documented. You know, where coders will know that it's this particular surface with the, with the fusion uh, device. That's one question. My comment is I'm not really sure uh, which um, option I prefer right now. I need to give it more thought. Quite frankly, I'm not a huge fan of the new technology section, and I like to have surgical procedures uh, grouped together because that's what my classification expertise uh, tells me to do. So, um, but on the other hand, this normally wouldn't be something I'd even recommend coding separately, but I understand that you know, if it's approved for a uh, new technology and on payment, there'll be a need to identify this somehow, but I am also a little concerned whether coders will even know it's a device using this surface versus some other kind of fusion device. Okay, thank you for your question. Nellie Lee on Chisane American Hospital Association. Um, one recommendation, and I don't know at, at this point right now, because uh, I share Sue's concerns about Section X, but my recommendation is whatever um, the standard or recommended language that physicians will use in their documentation, whether it's the brand name of the device or some, something else, that it be added to the device key so that if nano texture surface is not explicitly documented in the record, at least the coders have some place to look up what this is and, and where it should go. Thank you, Nellie. Good morning, my name is Gordon Schatz. I'm <clears throat> Vice President uh, for Reimbursement Policy at Quorum Consulting. I'm very pleased to be here with Jeff and on behalf of Titan Spine, Dr. Peter Ulrich is also here. I would like um, to focus 
on options three and four. And just to pick up on Nellie's last comment, I believe on behalf of the company, um, they probably would agree very much with greater specificity with respect to the particular um, pr name of the product. This has been done, I think, in some other areas of ICD-10 ICD and I think would um, facilitate accurate hospital billing. Uh, just comments briefly um, on option three and option four. <clears throat> option three creates new codes in the new technology X section. It adds device specific uh, interbody fusion device nano textured surface. We think that's an excellent first step by virtue of identifying the technology and maybe another one would help. Equally important, it uses the same spinal joint body part values which are in the corresponding body system. That is upper joints and lower joints in the med surge, ORG and OSG fusion section of ICD-10. And these constructs are specific to the cervical, thoracic, lumbar and other parts of the spine. Because of that specificity, we recommend option three. They're more precise. It fits the ICD-10 conventions, and it's also consistent with the CMS policy on procedures in the X section of the new technology. Um, CMS was very helpful about uh, back in October in their MLN. One of the things when they spoke about the new technology X section, um, they noted, in fact, section X codes maintain continuity with the other sections in ICD-10 by using the same root operations and body part values as their closest counterparts in other sections of ICD-10. We think option three does that very well. Final uh, comment um, um, with respect to option four, which as you said is also in the technology section. The streamlined language, which only identifies you know, one or two through seven or eight and more, doesn't give the precision in the part of the spine. And even though it's streamlined and a step in the right direction, option three probably takes you pretty close to that, that accuracy, including some of the comments we heard a little bit earlier. Bottom line, we'd recommend option three on behalf of Titan Spine. Um, very much appreciate Michelle, your and Pat's and Maddie's um, uh, help in setting up the meeting. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you, Gordon. Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, Jean Yoder, uh, Defense Health Agency. I'm a contractor supporting decision support. I'm a, a healthcare analyst, and um, you know, I, I, I like that uh, option four because it's streamlined, but as a data analyst, if I'm going to go in and I'm going to try to find everything, it, it, by having the section X and having it identical to what it would have been, I can just take and I can find the other cats and dogs that have been tossed back in the X's and put them with everything else. But if you streamline it, then I can't find them quickly just by taking the X off and using the last six, okay? So it's one of those things as a data analyst, I would prefer if it, uh, streamlining looks nice, but trying to find the stuff later would be a real mess. Great, thank you, Jean. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all those comments, and we'll look forward to getting them all in writing. We're now going to move on to topic five, and you're going to find this on page 27 through 33 of the handouts, insertion of endobronchial coils. And I will be introducing Dr. Momen Wahidi, who's from Duke University, and I understand actually works with coding a great deal. So he's one of those few that understands what we're talking about in addition to the clinical part. So we're glad to have him here. Now, the issue today is there is not a unique ICD-10 PCS code to describe the insertion of an endobronchial coil. It is uh, under consideration. They are considering applying for new technology, not for this year, but late this year for FY 2018. And so we'll have the uh, background information now. 
Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm a pulmonologist at Duke University Medical Center, and as Pat mentioned, I'm also involved in revenue at Duke University and lead initiatives on proper coding documentation, and I've been learning from my coding colleagues on a weekly basis, and uh, I feel uh, privileged to work with them and learn a lot about coding. And I led the effort for ICD-10, and thankfully, it's been uneventful for our medical center, uh, as I'm sure it's been for you, but I've spent a lot of time educating our providers. Not always thrilled to be educated about these issues. So I, I feel the coder's pain. Um, let me make sure. Which one? It's the green button on the black one here, sorry. Thank you. So um, I will cover today just the, uh, a little background on emphysema, uh, and the patient's needs, uh, talk about the technology, the endobronchial coils, and then we'll talk about the request for the code. Um, as uh, Pat mentioned, the uh, company that manufactures this Numerax is anticipating that they will submit a PMA around mid-2016 for approval. So just to give you a background uh, on respiratory diseases, uh, airway obstruction is a very common issue we deal with, and the two major categories are asthma and COPD. And under COPD, really, it, there are two types, uh, emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis is more a disease of a smaller airways and manifested predominantly by cough and uh, productive cough while emphysema is more destruction of the alveolar sacs of the lungs and manifested predominantly by dyspnea. However, there's a huge overlap and patients can have both types or one predominant type. And this is a little bit of a complex graph, but this walks you through the disease emphysema and the type of it and what treatments are available today. So we know that there's about four million patients in the United States with emphysema and much more globally. And today, uh, there's really not a lot of treatment other than inhalers, uh, lung transplant for a small portion of the patients. And this shows you the, the emphysema types. Emphysema also can be homogeneous, as you see on the left. Homogeneous meaning the destruction in the uh, alveolar sacs is uniform throughout the lungs, or more heterogeneous on the right, which is more concentrated in lobes, specifically the upper lobes of the lungs. And you can see if it's more heterogeneous, um, we can do things like surgical lung volume reduction where you can actually remove the more destructed uh, parts of the lungs, like the upper lungs, uh, lobes. However, the surgery has not been very popular, although it's been approved and present for a decade uh, because, because of its morbidity and mortality, and actually the number of surgeries performed has dwindled uh, over the last decade. There are things like valves also that can be done for heterogeneous emphysema. Those are being studied uh, in research currently in the United States. And there's the cause where you see the cause actually work both in homogeneous and heterogeneous emphysema. And I'll spend some time on the mechanism of the cause in the next few slides. The, the, the typical patient or the ideal patient for this uh, technology is unfortunately way too common, we see it in my clinic all the time, is severe emphysema, stage three or four gold stage uh, COPD. Uh, patients are very symptomatic, and they are uh, doing everything they can. They're using their inhalers, they're part participating in pulmonary rehabilitation, and yet they're still symptomatic. And they're supposed to be stable. When I say stable, it's, this is not for a patient that's in and out of the hospital all the time or uh, being intubated and mechanically ventilated, so somewhat stable, very symptomatic, and doing their best to control their disease. And the coils actually are made of uh, nitinol, which is a metal that has uh, shape memory, meaning that it goes back to its original shape no matter how you stretch it. So the idea is that you actually stretch it, straighten it out uh, before deployment, and then you deploy it in the lung, and when it is deployed and free, uh, it coils back to its original shape. And as it coils back, it brings down uh, the lung tissue with it, and it really gathers and compresses that lung tissue. The issue with emphysema, if I can uh, draw you an analogy, the, the air sac should be like a thin walled balloon. It should inflate and deflate with inspiration and expiration. In emphysema, those air sacs become like a grocery bag with air in it. Very flimsy, unable to expand uh, to, to provide that gas exchange. And also the airways need to be tethered. A, a good lung parenchyma, healthy, 
uh, apply some traction on those airways and keep them open. When the lung is destroyed, you can't do that. And the idea is when you coil down the lung tissue, you're reducing that size, you're compressing the lung tissue to get it to apply traction on the airways and also to have that elastic recoil to, to go from a grocery bag to a better balloon. And this is the technology and the delivery system of it. Uh, you can see the coils there, they come in three sizes. Um, it's deployed via bronchoscopy. You put a bronchoscope through the mouth and, and into the airways. And there's the uh, typical deployment uh, tools, a catheter, a guide wire, a cartridge that have the, the coil straightened out, and then uh, a deployment catheter. This is done usually in the operating room or endoscopy suite under sedation or general anesthesia with the help of fluoroscopy to see where the coils are being deployed. And this is just an illustration of, uh, in the middle, you see it straight uh, right before deployment. Once you deploy it, uh, it coils back. And you can see, on average, we put 10 coils in each lung. Usually it's two procedures separated about three months to uh, so we put 10 coils in one lung, wait three months, and put 10 coils in the other lung. This is a movie, and I hope we can click on it. Um, thank you. And it just illustrates um, the deployment here. We don't have quick time. All right, so uh, no movie. Uh, it, it was just a movie showing you that the, the coil is straight, loaded in the bronchoscope. It's let out into the lung, into specific uh, bronchial segments in each uh, specific lobe in the lung, and then it coils down the lung. Uh, th there are randomized control trials that have studied this technology and showed its effectiveness. You can see up top there, RESET trial and Revlon's trial. These are global trials. The U.S. trial is the RENEW trial that you can see at the bottom there, uh, 315 patients um, and uh, 30 centers. Uh, the trial is being published soon. and. Uh, We'll have the results publicly available. Uh, there's some uh, publicly available results preliminary. But it's been shown that this uh, technology can improve the quality of life of these desperate patients as well as improve their exercise capacity significantly. And to date, or at least in 2015, about 462 patients um, uh, have completed uh, the coil procedures and clinical trials. And this is uh, available and approved in Europe and the rest of the world. So that's the uh, clinical background on this technology. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any clinical questions before we go through the coding options? Okay, we'll wait for the um, coding slides to come up. See if this one will work. Okay. The, um, for the current coding of this, you would code the procedure with the root operation values insertion, removal, or revision as appropriate from tables OBH, OBP, and OBW respectively. And you would use the body part value tracheobronchial tree and the device value intraluminal device. So that's the current coding. And you can see pictorial representations for the removal and the revision. Option one would be not to create new codes for the insertion of endobronchial coals and continue using these uh, current uh, values under removal, and insertion, removal, or revision in the table shown above, and the body part value tracheobronchial tree and the device value intraluminal device. Option two would create a new device value, intraluminal device, endobronchial coils for the body part values and table OBH for the insertion of the endobronchial valve. And we would add the same body part values to the OBP for the removal of these coils and to OBW for the revision of endobronchial coils. And you see here for the insertion and the removal and the revision. Option three 
we would create new values for intraluminal device endobronchial coils for the body part values currently in OBH for insertion of the endobronchial valve, but we would use the current nonspecific body part values of tracheobronchial tree and the device value interluminal device for the removal and revision of these devices. And you see here the insertion with the new device, and you see that um, and we would not change the other two. Now this is a, a, a consideration for a new technology for next year. So we would also evaluate creating new codes in the X section, the new technology section, to identify the endoscopic insertion, removal, and revision of the endobronchial coils. We would use the same bronchus body part values that are in the respiratory system of the medical surgical section. And you will see on this where we've added the device. And you would see that we've also added the device in the X section for the removal and for the revision. Option five is, once again, a streamlined version for your consideration. We could create new codes in the X section, new technology, to identify the endoscopic insertion, removal, and revision of the endobronchial coils but we could use a streamlined body part values and just say bronchus right, bronchus left in the new technology sim uh, section for simplified coding and data collection. And you'll see that here for the insertion and for the removal and for the revision. Now our recommendation would be the option five, which was the streamlined approach where we create the new codes in the X section to identify the endoscopic insertion, removal, and revision of endobronchial coils, and we would have the body part values just a bronchus right and bronchus left. And in the meantime, you would use the uh, codes that we provide in the current coding. We would welcome at this time any comments on these uh, options for creating new codes. I'm probably going to say this one. My, uh, Say your name first. Thank you. It's, I'm Linda Holtzman from Clarity Coding. Um, I, have, I guess I have a question that's both uh, clinical and coding. Um, exactly what are the coils doing? I, I watched the, uh, um, the slides uh, very carefully, and I, I, I reviewed um, the description. It talks about compressing the tissue or tethering it or retentioning. Uh, I'm not quite clear what it's doing, and the reason I'm asking is the coding aspect. Usually when we see coiling now, um, you know, placement of a coil, it's, you know, for an aneurysm or uh, an AVM, something like that, and so you automatically think root operation restriction or root operation occlusion. But here you're talking about root operation insertion. So it's, it's not clear to me what the distinction is and exactly what the coils are doing here. Um, that would make it insertion as opposed to restriction or occlusion. And I guess I, guess I have a, a real concern that when I see coils, I automatically think restriction, occlusion. If, if this is going to be different, and it, it may be that you know, it should be different, um, then that will need to be explained very clearly so that people don't automatically go toward the two root operations that were, were most commonly associated with coiling at this time. I would say, I mean, it's a completely new, innovative approach, mm -hmm. so it's, it's hard to, to sort of put it in a category. It's really what you're trying to do is reshape that lung that's hyperinflated and, and, and flaccid. You're trying to compress it, reshape it, reduce its volume by putting these coils that sort of bring tension and bring it back to the original shape it should be rather than be in this big bag of air that's not functional. So, so I don't know if that fits in the coding world. How does that translate? Is that, um, <laughs> it, it is either. coiling. Um, <laughs> it is putting coils, uh, like putting the coils in the vessel. It's just doing, you know, you're not overcoming a stenosis or narrowing. It's reshaping the organ shape and properties. So you're, you're putting the coils into the, the lumen of the bronchus. Yes, so right. it extends all the way. Remember the bronchi right, you know, right. branches all the way to be really small. So you're putting them all the way out, right. okay. and they're straight. But once you release them from the catheter, they just coil back and so, bring that tissue around them in. Okay, I think I understand this. So yeah. in other words, the objective here is not 
to close the lumen per se, or even to partially close the lumen, but rather to to tether or reshape the yes. the the lung tissue itself. That's why the coils are springing back. Yeah, and, okay. and it's actually opening it. the airway adjacent to it okay. by doing that reshaping. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. I can understand yeah. now why it would be insertions. Just we're going to have to explain that very carefully. I'm actually looking at the back of Nellie's head. Um, we're going to have to explain that very carefully, that that's what these coils are doing as opposed to the kinds of coils that you see with an aneurysm or an AVM or something like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sue Bowman with the American Health Information Management Association. One of my questions actually was the same as Linda's about whether there was another root operation that would more um, accurately describe what's being done. So that was a good explanation. Thank you. Uh, my other comment would be is uh, my understanding is this is uh, for a new tech ad for FY 2018. Is that correct? Yes. So I guess one comment I have is whether um, 2016, this October, would be a little premature to implement this new code, particularly when we have more than 3,000 other PCS codes that have to be implemented this October, and perhaps uh, this one should be considered more for October of 2017, which would still fit in with the uh, new tech application. And regarding the options, um, I have to think about it a little bit more since I only really looked at them uh, this morning, but I kind of like option two. As I mentioned earlier, I'm, I don't really like the new technology section except for services like medication administration and things like that that we wouldn't normally even code in PCS. I like having the surgical procedures be surgical procedures and from the patient's perspective, you know, whether it's new or old or whatever, the procedure is the procedure and sort of keeping them all together and I figured if we're going to have an insertion code, we might as well create the, the uh, other codes, the removal and the revision and so on distinctly as well. Thank you, Sue. And we would welcome comments from the rest of you in the audience. Um, if you uh, disagree with the implementation date of this October 1st and, and why, and what's your options. Does anybody else have any more comments on the options? Well, thank you. Then we look forward to you evaluating this one and sending in your comments. Can I make a comment? Yes. I'm going to put my coding hat now. I removed my clinical hat. And, uh, you know, ICD-10 has trained me to think about specificity, specificity. So if you're considering option four and five, from a clinical standpoint, I would say option four would be better because you actually specify the exact lobe. And I would encourage that. I'm, I'm harping it in my physicians always, you know, specify where your operation is. And I think that would align well with the ICD-10 sort of uh, uh, theme. So thank you. Thank you. We always like physicians who talk to coders and make the physicians document well in the record, so we really appreciate that point. We'll now move on to, to topic six, hematopoietic cell transplant donor type. And we'll be getting one of our speakers on the phone while I describe the issue. Uh, Stephanie Barnia it's uh, director of the Marrow Donor Program. She couldn't, uh, she's from Minneapolis, she could not be here today, but she sent her slides in and I will be advancing her slides as she tells me to, so that she can make a presentation on this issue. And I will describe the issue for you. The issue is that ICD-10 PCS does not have codes which differentiate between a related an unrelated donor, an allogeneic hemopoietic cell transplant. And this is not a new technology application. And so if we have Stephanie on the phone, if you could uh, identify yourself, and I will go to your first slide, and you can tell me when to advance. Stephanie? Okay, thanks, Pat. Yep, it's Stephanie Farnia here. Um, good morning, everybody. Sorry I couldn't be there in person today. And I want to thank you for taking the time to talk about this, um, this topic. So, Pat, if you could go to the background slide, that would be great. Yes, we're there. Okay. So the National Marrow Donor Program operates uh, the Be the Match Donor Registry, which is the national registry for the United States. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we hold the contracts with the Health Resources and Services Administration for uh, the Congressman Bill Young Cell Transplantation Program. And as a part of that, we have a number of different responsibilities one of which is focusing on reducing financial barriers to transplant, which includes assisting transplant centers with coding and billing issues like this. So over the past um, 25 years, we've facilitated more than 70,000 marrow and cord blood transplants that 
lately has been approximately 6,500 per year. We have more than 11 million potential donors on the registry and 174 transplant programs. Um, some of those are adult only, some are pediatric, and some are both across the country. So if you wouldn't mind going to the, the next slide, Pat, that would be great. So hematopoietic cell transplant, also known as, as bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant, we like to have several different names just to confuse everybody. Um, there are two types of, of HCT autologous, and these are the majority of the transplants that are done. That's when the patient's own cells are reinfused after treatment, and it's about 11,000 cases per year. Um, and allogeneic, which is when a donor's cells are needed for immune reconstitution. And this, the, the difference between the two of these depends on uh, the disease that the patient is being treated for and a number of other factors. So in the allogeneic setting, there are about 8,000 transplants per year. About 6,000 of those are unrelated. Uh, the related donor, when we talk about that, that utilizes cells from a biological sibling or other family member, it used to only be a sibling that was a, considered a full um, HLA match, and now in recent years it, there have been some changes to be able to sometimes use a, a parent or even a child of the patient, and we call those a haploidentical match. The unrelated donors, we utilize cells from either a volunteer adult donor or from a cryopreserved cord blood unit um, that we all have as part of the cord blood banks and on the registry. And about 70% of patients that need an allogeneic transplant will need an unrelated donor source due to um, limitations in terms of their biological families odds of, of matching or being able to move forward as a donor because of their own health issues. So if you could go to the next slide, Pat. The, the reasons for the code request are, are very simple, and I'll keep this uh, very brief. There was a precedent in ICD-9 where there was, as you can see, 00 0.91 and 92, which differentiated between the um, donor, the live donor types, the adult donor types. And a couple of additional reasons. Um, one is, is sort of practical, Medicare's billing guidance <laughs> requests that we differentiate between these donor types to accurately report services. And the, the third bullet there, the Stem Cell Therapeutics Outcomes Database. So this is part of the, the HRSA administration's, or uh, the HRSA contract where all allogeneic transplants must be reported to the Center for International Blood Marrow Transplant Research, the CIBMTR. And as part of that reporting, a very important aspect of that is, is the donor type that was used so that a, a number of different research projects can be used to track those patients. There's, there's long-term tracking on every allogeneic um, transplant recipient, and there are different clinical practices based on the donor type, different clinical outcomes, things like um, graft-versus-host disease. It, there's highly detailed forms that are filled out for every one of these patients. Um, at different time intervals, and it's important to have a consistent and trackable code that identifies the donor source as part of the medical record and um, the, the tracking that happens with those patients. And finally, there, there is a variation in resource use. So there are different costs of acquiring donor cells based on if it is a related family member that can travel to the transplant center and um, can have marrow extracted or apheresis performed there versus if it has to be one of the donors from the registry, and there's a different series of, of logistics and events that has to happen to get those cells harvested and, and to the patient where they're located. So tracking of that um, donor type is also useful in trying to understand the variation in, in resource use and the types of resources that we use for those donor cells. And then the last cell is just um, a very simple version of our request that we would uh, be very appreciative if there was a way to differentiate between those donor types in the ICD-10 coding system. Thank you. And does anybody have any clinical questions for Stephanie? If not, then we will move on to the coding options and we'll wait for those slides to come up. Okay, and now we are at the current coding. Uh, since we cannot tell the donor type now, then you would code the procedure with the appropriate values from the table 302, the transfusion tables. 
and you would use qualifier one non-autologous and the body part and substance value is shown in this slide. Option one would be not to create any codes for the donor type and just consider, continue using the existing codes. And I'm gonna give you a little hint. Part of the reason we'll have in several options is we're trying to figure out what to do when the documentation doesn't show the donor type. So you'll see a theme. Okay, so coding option two is we could create new qualifier values allogeneic related or allogeneic unrelated slash unknown for the central and peripheral vein body part values and the substance values bone marrow, stem cells, cord blood, and stem cells, hemopoietic, and table 302. We would delete the qualifier value one non-autologous for only this set of tables and use the new qual qualifier value allogeneic unknown or unrelated for coding procedures where the bone marrow donor genetic match is either unrelated or the genetic relationship is not documented. Option two, we could create uh, new qualifiers, two allogeneic related, three allogeneic unrelated. Uh, for these, we could delete value one for non-autologous and use the qualifier of value Z, no qualifier, for coding procedures where we don't know the bone marrow transplant donor relationship. It's not documented. Option four, we could create new qualifiers to allogeneic related, allogeneic unrelated for these, and then we could use the qualifier value one, non-autologous, for coding procedures where the bone marrow transplant donor relationship is not documented. Now CMS recommends option two, create the new qualifier values to allogeneic related or three allogeneic unrelated for the central and peripheral uh, vein body part values and the substance value bone marrow stem cells cord blood and stem cells, hematic poetic, in table 302. And we would delete the qualifier one, non-autologous for only this table 302, and use the qualifier value Z, no qualifier for coding procedures where the bone marrow transplant donor relationship is not documented. That's our recommendation as of today, which is probably changed hourly. So we would <laughs> greatly appreciate comments this morning and then later. And in the interim, we would just continue using the existing codes which don't provide this information. So does anybody have any early thoughts on this? I'm Nellie Lee and she's St. American Hospital Association. I like the idea of giving an out for when there is no specificity in the record, but I'm not sure that unless we provide guidance, people will know that Z, no qualifier, means unspecified. And I know we've stayed away from the words unspecified in PCS, but what you're really saying is where it's not specified as being uh, allogeneic or not. So is there some other terminology we could use if it's just totally taboo to use the word unspecified, whether uh, allogeneic or not, or something along those lines, because I'm not sure that I would have automatically assumed that Z meant I don't have any other information. It, I think we, you know, we would have been thinking that we needed to query or find out one of the other options. We would love to have some language if you think that we should put another indicator in there with the words unknown. Uh, okay, but is, is unspecified totally off Why don't you write limits? it down and suggest it so that we can look okay. at the value in this. And as you think about it, because I, I find this hard to grapple to, to right. know that you have the correct number of choices and that you have the out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sue Bowman from AHIMA, and uh, I don't know what the, um, the, the real right answer is. There might be other choices that aren't even listed. I'd have to think it through, but uh, I agree with Nellie's comments, but I'm also concerned about uh, losing the distinction between autologous and allogeneic just because you don't know whether the donor is related or not, which is the way I interpret that option. So I actually sort of like, was leaning towards option two, which at least it gives it sort of a default if you don't know whether the donor is related, but it still allows you to uh, have the distinction between autologous or not. 
And I also agree with Nellie that if you have a non-autologous option, but then you have a, a no qualif you have other options that look like they conflict with or could mean something similar, you could have a lot of confusion for people who weren't privy to this meeting and understood <laughs> what the intent of these different options were. So I like sort of saying sort of a default for allogeneic, unrelated, if it's not documented as related or unrelated, but allowing the autologous and allogeneic distinction to, to still stand. Thank you, Seb. Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting, and Sue said, um, basically what I was gonna say did it very eloquently. Uh, I do feel that the Z no qualifier is very misunderstood and we should avoid that. And if we choose option three, we lose the difference between autologous and non-autologous. And so I like option two the best. Thank you, these are also very excellent comments we've gotten today and I know you all want to think this through and if you want to send options six, seven, eight, nine, we're glad to have them. Okay, now we will have Michelle Joshua come back up again for the next topic and she will be introducing the topic and the speaker. Okay, our next topic is, is minimally invasive aortic valve replacement. And the issue here is currently there are no ICD-10 PCS procedure codes to distinguish aortic valve replacement devices that are used in a minimally invasive surgical approach. Should we create a new ICD-10 PCS code? And here to present the clinical aspects of this device is Dr. Sai Prasad. Welcome. Thank you, Michelle. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sai Prasad, and my background is uh, my cardiac surgeon. I recently joined Edward Life Sciences. Oh, this one, yes, thank you. Today, what I'm gonna discuss uh, are the following topics, which is understanding of aortic valve disease and its uh, treatment, and overview of uh, advert intuity elite system, why this is unique uh, heart valve, and uh, also take you through some of the study findings uh, regarding the clinical outcomes and uh, valve performance. So the review of aortic valve disease and uh, focus on aortic stenosis involves um, the disease pattern, what is aortic stenosis is. Aortic stenosis uh, is a degenerative calcification of the aortic valve leaflets. As an aging process, this occurs more so in elderly patients. Normally, aortic valve leaflets are polythin paper-like, and then the calcium deposits in it, as you can see in the slide on the left-hand side and then uh, makes the valve leaflets uh, become very stiff, hardened, and uh, the leaflets do not open, and then they become very restrictive to the blood flow from the main pumping chamber of the heart into the aorta. Generally, uh, patients tend to tolerate quite well until they start developing symptoms. So there's a latent period, and uh, they present uh, with uh, angina, which is a chest pain radiating to the arm, or they can present with syncope, loss of consciousness, or they can present with uh, heart failure. From the time the patients develop the symptoms, uh, they rapidly deteriorate and the life expectancy dramatically drops down to approximately five to six years. As you can see there, if they develop heart failure, then they have a, a life expectancy of about two years. So this is a very serious condition on its own. And this is a growing condition. In other words, um, it's predicted uh, that there will be 25,000 additional um, operations are required to treat this uh, condition in USA by 2020. 
In other words, 125,000 procedures will be approximately done in, by 2020. This is a rapidly uh, developing condition as the aging, as, the, as elderly patients' uh, life expectancy is increasing, uh, more and more uh, this disease is seen to be prevalent. In general, there are two types of uh, management of aortic stenosis. Uh, first is a medical management, and through the, until the patient uh, develops symptoms in its latent phase, and then subsequent to that, uh, once they develop symptoms, uh, there are two options. Uh, one is um, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, that is performing this uh, new technology aortic valve through the percutaneous, either transfemoral through the femoral artery or uh, through the minimally invasive small incision on the left side of the chest here or on the top of your breastbone. And this, is, uh, this new technology is uh, available only to patients who are pro prohibitively high risk or very high risk patients. On the other hand, uh, should a patient require uh, a surgical operation, then standard surgical aortic valve replacement uh, is, is accepted modality of, of management. And then this standard surgical aortic valve replacement is done either through a, a full stenotomy, which is full, your breastbone is cut fully, or through a, a small incision in the front of his chest, front of the chest, or on the side of the chest. And these are the uh, approaches to the replacement of the aortic valve. As you could see there, uh, the full sternotomy is opening the whole of the sternum. And then the middle one is opening only a part of the sternum, uh, about six centimeters. And then the uh, third one is uh, on the, without opening the breastbone at all, you, you operate on the side of, in the front of the chest. These are technically demanding procedures, and uh, they require um, certain skills. And also these procedures uh, are often uh, used uh, based on patient's uh, comorbidities, specifically tailored to the individual needs based on their uh, comorbidities. The minimally invasive surgery uh, offers uh, patients several benefits, and as well as uh, reduces complications. It reduces the in-hospital length of stay and also uh, reduces the need for blood transfusions. Having said that, uh, replacement of the aortic valve, uh, standard valve, through the minimally invasive procedure takes longer to do. In other words, it takes much uh, about eight to ten minutes extra length of the time, and during which time the heart is unnecessarily subjected to um, high risk of having no blood supply to it. In other words, it can prone for heart attacks. For this reason, there was a need for developing uh, a new technology and new approaches uh, to simplify the procedure. When we looked at um, the procedural steps, the most of the time, it's actually the implantation of the valve uh, takes longer time to do rather than any other elements. So the adverts, life sciences, come up with uh, this new technology, new, new device, which simplifies the procedure. Now the traditional valve, uh, as you can see here, uh, is used uh, by placement of 15 to 18 sutures. So the next few slides I'll take you through the adverts in GT lead system. So this system is a new technology which is made of an existing platform of uh, what we call as perimount manganese um, bovine uh, leaflet tissue and is mounted on a, a frame and uh, this and a cloth covered polyester uh, cloth covers uh, a stainless steel frame which is below the surface of the valve. The stainless steel frame expands uh, when we distend a balloon. It's a balloon expandable valve. So the stainless steel frame anchors itself into the main pumping chamber uh, at, the, at the outflow of blood coming out of the main pumping chamber under the aortic valve. It anchors itself. 
And also, we use this, uh, instead of 15 sutures, we use uh, three sutures to guide the valve into the small incision space. So that makes it a lot easier for the procedure to be done. And it also uh, lessens the time of the operation. However, the, as I said, uh, this is not uh, very well taken. I mean, the minimal invasive surgery procedures are not very well taken in the surgical community because of complexity of the procedure and lack of suitable devices to make it perform in a simplistic manner. And as you see, uh, more laterally, with the introduction of this device, uh, there's an uptake of about 55% in one of the trials called Triton trial. In Germany itself, there's an uptake of about 20% of the procedures being done in a small cut incision. And this is a schematic diagram of a much more um, uh, expanded frame, uh, which shows you instead of 15 sutures, uh, we use three sutures to guide this valve. As I said, it's actually the, the length of the time the valve is implanted is what it takes a long time at the time of the procedure. And uh, this, uh, as we know, uh, minimal invasive surgical procedures uh, has a lot of benefits to the patients, hospital, and also uh, to, the, to the surgical surgeons themselves. Um, this also has been shown uh, in several studies, uh, particularly both uh, in Europe, um, which is Triton uh, study, which is a large number of patients uh, were enrolled in this study, and it showed that this, uh, it is feasible, and also safety and efficacious uh, nature of this procedure has been uh, well uh, reported. And also there are other trials, which is the Triton subset trial, which also shows the patient benefits, and also Cadence and Cadence, Cadence MIS study, which is a randomized study, looking at the minimally invasive surgery against the full sternotomy surgery. And these studies have shown the significant reduction of operating time and also implant, implantation time. In US uh, itself, the last study, the TRANSFORM study, uh, we are currently conducting a trial on 920 patients uh, over the last four years. And this is a large multicenter uh, study, uh, which is uh, conducted in 29 centers, which is a single label, a non-randomized prospective uh, study. And comparing uh, the surgical standard aortic valve with various subset of minimal, in minimal in invasive procedures, and as well as um, standardized data against the other databases, such as Society of Thoracic Surgeons uh, database. The study population itself is a standard surgical valve and also concomitant operations, such as needing a bypass surgery or replacement of another valve or repair of another valve. And this trial is meant to be looking at uh, primary safety uh, and also secondary effectiveness uh, of uh, the outcomes. And this study, uh, the preliminary results, uh, this is an FDA IDE study. Um, the preliminary results did show there's a reduction in procedural times and also reduction in the readmissions, reoperations, and 30-day uh, mortality. And there was also a reduction in the length of stay. As I said uh, a few seconds ago, there's an increased uh, reduction in mortality and the patient benefits, reduction of complications, and also the hospital point of view, there are benefits. And uh, for surgeons, it's a simplified way of uh, undertaking the procedure. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Dr. Prasad? No clinical questions? Okay, so we'll move into the coding at this time. Thank you. You can see it. Okay, coding options for aortic valve replacement would include our current coding options, which are 
coding options from table 0 to R with the root operation replacement, which includes an option in the body part for, in the body part section for aortic valve. Coding option one would be not to create a new ICD-10 PCS code for the Edwards Intuity Elite Valve System Technique and to continue using codes in table 0 to R as shown. Coding option two would be to create a new qualifier rapid deployment technique for procedures that use a rapid deployment technique in the same table 0 to R applied to the body part value aortic valve as shown. Coding option three, as this is a new technology, would be to create a new technology code in section X to identify procedures that use a rapid deployment surgical technique for aortic valve replacement, procedures that use a zooplastic derived prosthetic valve as described in the table. CMS recommends option three, creating a new code in section X for new technology. Interim coding advice would be to continue using the current coding with root operation values in table 02R. Do we have any comments related to the coding? Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting. I think it's a clinical question. In option two, you have listed this new rapid deployment system in the row that lists this as a percutaneous option. Is this clinically possible, doctor, with the stitches involved? No, it's not a percutaneous. Uh, it has to be an open procedure. Okay. All right. With, with that change to option two, I would advocate option two. Um, I'm always going to advocate an option to put a surgical procedure in the body of PCS rather than the X section for uh, the purist in me. Thank you. Hi, Matt Moore with Edwards Life Sciences. And just a, co a comment or two that kind of follows Ms. Keens. Um, first, um, in coding option two, it is worth noting that the approach, again, would never be done in a percutaneous manner. Um, but rather open. Furthermore, on September 14th, we applied for a qualifier to separate out um, the valve surgery incision types, that being right anterior thoracotomy, upper hemisternotomy, and um, full sternotomy. So assuming that request was accepted, accepted and we're optimistic giving the high number of changes to the system, um, we hope it falls in there. Um, it would be appropriate, um, option two would be appropriate if it specifically called out the incision type, i.e., rapid deployment hemisternotomy, rapid deployment full sternotomy, et cetera, to um, hold on to that. So a key point that I'm trying to make with this particular comment is we would like to be able to best utilize the ICD-10 to track intuity, but not to sacrifice the ability to track the incisional technique for both intuity and non-intuity surgical valve procedures. That's the quick first comment. Second comment, um, we understand that given the new technology distinction, specific to um, coding option three, um, section X may seem most appropriate. However, uh, there is still the issue of no pathway to recognize the incisional choice. Again, rat, right anterior thoracotomy, upper hemisternotomy, et cetera. That said, taking into account the restricted real estate of section X, uh, of a section X option, uh, in order to identify each incisional approach, we would uh, most likely need to have three separate types of device codes and attach the incisional technique. This may be a bit laborious and, and the O2R may be the best route to, to take to approach this or, or to correct for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nellie Lee on Chistain American Hospital Association. So this is my standard question about documentation. Will the physician be documenting rapid deployment technique, or what terminology would we find in the operative report? Because the title of this uh, tab was uh, minimally invasive, but then we're hearing, you know, well, it could be done in different ways. So how, as a coder, would I be able to identify this procedure based on the documentation? 
I mean, uh, essentially when the surgeons document it, they put their approach first. So right hand here, thoracotomy, upper mini stenotomy or hemi stenotomy or okay. full stenotomy. Uh, so that's how surgeons, when they're dictating uh, the operation note, uh, use it. Uh, but it won't tell me that particular incision equals rapid deployment because you can make a sternotomy and do an open procedure and use the traditional technology that you used before. So I guess I'm, I'm looking for what would help the coder distinguish this from the traditional aortic valve replacement. The, the, the incision alone wouldn't be enough. Okay. So is there some other thing? I know in the, in the um, information it sounded like yeah, um, you're using a, a balloon. Would that be enough? Because probably not, right? Because you are, there are other um, aortic valve replacements that use a stent and balloon. So what, what, what key words would I be looking for, I guess is what I'm asking. Oh, my colleague has come to oh, answer. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, so the key word that you'd be looking for would be the Intuity device. That's our, our new technology. And the Intuity would track to or would map to um, the codes that would allow you to understand if a rapid deployment was being used. Does that, does that help? That, that, that is absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, I'm sorry. Um, uh, just a moment. Nellie, could you go to the uh, microphone so people on the line can hear? They can't hear you from the audience? Actually, I was trying to clarify that it's not the technique used, it's the device itself, right? So that's, that's how the device key would be helpful in telling me which qualifier I would use. I was just wanted to clarify that. That's and good. he nodded his head and he said yes. Yeah, that's good. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Shondell Newman, and I am the coding supervisor for the VA of Maryland Healthcare System. I am um, amazed at the, of the new technology um, term or category that we're going to inc um, include or may include with the, the, the devices that I've seen all day and as a surgical coder. I would um, really go with what Nellie said and all the other ladies today. The medical surgical area is where we would look for that procedure and what device was done, the laterality as far as our body part, and everything could be. Um, I understand this new technology, but we would, they would not, most coders, know to go to a new technology area unless they were here today. Um, that's just you know, the way I see it. And um, I think that if we would have our device in there, also where you had our rapid, de um, rapid deployment techno um, technology, I, I believe that was in the device as well with um, the zootoplasty tissue on one of the slides mm -hmm. that was recommended. Um, you would get more information. Oh, I definitely don't like that one. No, <laughs> go back to the no. I would go with number two option. But I just wanted to, you know, say, as a person who's been coding for 15 years surgeries, that I would definitely be looking under the medical surgical, not as a new um, technology. New technology is important for us to educate on as a um, provider educator as well. I just feel we would be better off with the medical surgical um, category. Thank you for your comment. Good morning. I'm Brian Duncan. I'm the uh, Vice President of Medical Affairs for the Cardiac Surgery Business Unit for Levanova. So Levanova manufactures the only FDA-approved, commercially available uh, aortic heart valve, uh, bioprosthetic aortic heart valve in this category of, uh, of devices. Um, we wanted to go on the record uh, saying that we agree with uh, CMS's recommendation uh, for option three regarding this new ICD-10 ICD procedure code. But we certainly suggest modifying the language under the device, substance, and technology section to include sutureless slash rapid deployment, um, uh, rapid deployment uh, uh, category and including Percival in this category. So this classification sutureless slash rapid deployment has clinical relevance and really is the vernacular how this is talked about in the medical literature. And I'll give you three pieces of supporting, uh, supporting material on this. 
So first of all, our view is supported by the um, really the biggest sort of the seminal publications that have occur occurred in this field, particularly the consensus paper on the use of sutureless rapid deployment um, valve technologies. Uh, the uh, lead author is Gersak, uh, and it represents the International uh, Expert Consensus Panel, published in 2015. Uh, also, important meta-analyses just published last year by Fan, Hurley. All of those consider sutureless and rapid deployment valves together in this same category without distinction. Second point, um, Percival now has more than 110 um, uh, publications to support its use clinically, thousands of implants around the world, and they demonstrate uh, really a lot of the same elements that, that, and benefits, in fact virtually identical list of benefits, to those demonstrated or, or cited by Dr. Prasad, namely similar implantation technique, they are similar, quite similar, and then all the benefits of reduced procedure times um, uh, that result from the use of both of these devices are, are essentially the same. So the list of, of advantages that you saw uh, all essentially are the same. The third key point and finally, um, the same literature, um, uh, these 110 publications for Percival strongly supports um, the use of, um, of Percival as a strong enabler for a minimally invasive approach, just as Dr. Prasad cited for Intuity. A couple of, uh, and, and we can provide any of these uh, in our written comments as well, Micelli in 2014, Glauber is 2015, um, exactly the same as being claimed by Intuity. So, seminal articles, same benefits, uh, an implantation, uh, similar implantation technique, and then an enabler for minimally invasive uh, cardiac surgery. So in summary, again, we support option three uh, with the addition of the language sutureless slash rapid deployment as it appears consistently in the literature, uh, and then adding um, uh, Percival to this category. I'd like to thank CMS for the opportunity to uh, provide these comments. Uh, Gene Yoder, Defense Health Agency, supporting decision support. Um, as an analyst, I do not want to see a code used the same t for two different things within 10 years. And if we keep putting all of these temporary test kinds of things that will probably be over, you know, in five years, technology will have moved on to something else. We're going to run out of the, the codes and we're going to be out of space again, which was a bit of a problem that we've experienced before. So if, if we, you know, this X thing is a learning experience. And, and so if we had something in the main code set, you know, the, uh, O2 or zero, zero two R, and then wherever we have a new qualifier, you have like NT and then a dash and the new qualifier. That way the coder will find it where it's supposed to be, will know that it's a new technology thing and know to go back and get the new technology guy and use that code. Then, then we don't have this problem. Then we take care of Sue and all of the coders because we can find it where it should be instead of having to memorize all the stuff in the back of the book. But we, we also, you know, when we have the sunset and, and that goes away and it either becomes permanent or it's a goner, we don't have it all cluttered up in here as a permanent code, okay? So just, we have a lot of learning to do in order to figure out how not to clutter up our code set and run out of space. And, and so if you had some indicator in front of it so you could find it here and then no, go back to the X's. Just one of those ideas. It's probably a bad idea, but it's an idea, okay? <laughs> Thank you, G. Are there any other comments? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you Prasad. So much. We will now ask Maddie Hughes to come up and she will be addressing item eight which you can find on page 40 to 41 of your handouts. Hello, again. 
Uh, the issue is that ICD-10 PCS does not currently identify the endovascular repair of common iliac aneurysms for both the internal and external iliac arteries with a branch endograph. You might remember we had a similar proposal that was um, presented in the September meeting that dealt with branched um, and fenestrated endograph repairs for a variety of aneurysms. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Matthew Seidman. Got my timer. So thanks for, uh, thanks for having me back. Uh, this is, I guess, my third meeting in a row. Um, we're going to talk about uh, endovascular therapy. This is kind of a continuation of what I've talked to you guys about the last two times, about endovascular treatment of aneurysms of the aorta. And just to kind of rehash, we started at the ascending aorta, the thoracic aortic arch, for which they're not current endovascular therapies available but are coming down the pipe. Uh, then we have the descending thoracic aorta, the thoracoabdominal, the abdominal aorta, and the iliac arteries. Until recently, most of our treatments have been limited endovascularly to kind of straight parts of the, of the aorta where there are limited bifurcations and uh, not covering s significant vessels such as the renals, the great vessels to the head and neck and uh, the visceral arteries. One of those has also been the hypogastric artery uh, taking blood flow into the pelvis. So just a little rehash of aortic aneurysms. An aneurysm is a dilation of an artery more than one and a half times its normal diameter. Uh, ruptured aortic aneurysms account for 15,000 deaths each year in the US. Uh, when aneurysms are small and stable, they're not uh, very risky, but as they get bigger, there's the increased risk of rupture. When someone has a ruptured aneurysm, there's a greater than a 75 to 90 percent risk of mortality from it, whereas if we fix it electively before they rupture, the mortality is much more acceptable in the 5 percent range. So talking about types of grafts, the most simplest type is just a tube graft. It's a straight tube that's used to, to cover the weakened part of the aorta. This is uh, typically used in the descending thoracic aorta where the aorta is straight. Um, or in, in specialized saccular aneurysms of the inframenal aorta. What's more common in the inframenal aorta is a bifurcated graft. This is typical of most of the devices available where there's a straight part that goes in the aorta that then bifurcates into the iliacs, which are basically designed to end in the common iliac artery. Most of these are in a docking limb configuration, um, and there are some that are a unibody design. Um, there's about 39,000 or 40,000 EVAR procedures done every year. It's estimated that anywhere from 15 to 44 percent of them, uh, the aneurysmal disease extends into the common iliac arteries as well. Um, in about 25 percent of those cases where the aneurysmal disease extends into the common iliac artery, the extent of the disease in the iliac makes the endovascular repair complicated for a couple reasons. One, it can give us an inadequate uh, landing zone distally or a ceiling zone above the iliac bifurcation so that we can place the stent, but if it doesn't seal distally, then you have retrograde blood flow around the stent back into the aneurysm. The aneurysm is still pressurized and the patient's still at risk of rupture. Um, or the disease can extend into beyond the common iliac artery into the branches of the common iliac, either the internal, external, or, or both. So our, our current methods for dealing with that when we, we see that with patients is to either sacrifice blood flow to the internal iliac artery and extend the stent past the iliac bifurcation into the external. Um, we can do a surgical bypass where we go from the external iliac artery to the internal iliac artery, distal to the bifurcation, giving us a longer ceiling landing zone and allowing us to do a standard, um, a standard EVAR. Or some very, um, uh, very uh, intelligent physicians have been able to put pieces together that weren't quite what they were designed for to make, make it work and get flow into the internal and external iliac artery which um, uh, having done that a couple times can be met with various degrees of success. So uh, branch procedures uh, involve, um, it, it, the idea is to use, use a device that will accommodate that branch and maintain 
perfusion to the, the, pelvic, the, the pelvic organs and musculature and, and uh, um, organs by, by putting a, a branch into the internal iliac while having a branch going into the external iliac as well. Um, this is a significant advance because in our standard treatment where we coil and cover the hypogastric, if you do that on one side, 25% of the patients will have significant buttock claudication. If you do it on both sides, at least 50% will have significant limiting buttock claudication. But that's just one concern. There's also concerns about sexual dysfunction in, uh, in these individuals if you take out the hypogastric flow. There's concerns about bowel or colonic ischemia by limiting the flow into the hypogastric. And in, in rare cases, the, the hypogastrics perform, uh, provide significant blood flow to the spinal cord. So there's actually cases of spinal cord ischemia and paralysis by occluding some of the hypogastric blood flow. Um, as we said, there are about 40,000 EVARs per year. About 25% of them involve, um, involve the disease extending into the iliac arteries, complicating the EVAR procedure. This is just a little schematic of how we kind of currently deal with that about 80% of the time with the coil and cover approach. The other part, the reason we do that coil and cover, like I said, is to prevent a, a retrograde type 2 leak where we have blood flow coming back around the stent to the aneurysm. Um, and then the bottom picture is some of those uh, using extra pieces to try to make it work. Um, luckily for no us now, this has kind of been uh, coming for a while. Gore has uh, just on leap day got approval for their iliac device that's iliac branch device that's designed to address this problem. These are the results from their uh, clinical study that showed uh, very good technical success and excellent patency. 100% uh, actually of the external iliac branch and 95% patency of the internal iliac branch from their branch device. So the trial has showed improved clinical outcomes, decreased patient complications, and, and improved patient quality of life by maintaining pelvic perfusion. So in summary, the standard EVAR is currently performed in the iliac arteries. Uh, it's done for isolated iliac aneurysms. It can also be done as to extend the seal zone for an aortic aneurysm repair. There are several branch grafts that are designed specifically to treat the bifurcation of the iliac arteries that are in clinical trials. The uh, Gore excluder iliac branch endoprosthesis is the first FDA cleared device. Got its, uh, its approval on February 29th. Uh, we feel that the ICD-10 PCS coding needs to be refined to accurately report the use of the branched iliac endo, uh, endograft procedures. And I'm on time. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any clinical questions for Dr. Seidman? Okay. Um, as he mentioned, they were just granted FDA approval. And I just want to mention that this is a new technology uh, consideration. Under uh, current coding at the bottom of page 40, if you're following along. Uh, currently, you would report the uh, repair with table 04V, restriction of the lower arteries. And the um, issue with this is that it doesn't differentiate the standard versus the branched or endogra uh, fenestrated endograft repairs. Coding option one would be not to add a new device value to continue as it is under current coding. Coding option two is... Uh, similar to what was presented at the September 2015 meeting, and that would be to add a new device value, E, for intraluminal device branched or fenestrated to table 04V. And I'm hesitant to even mention option three based on <laughs> earlier comments. <laughs> However, we do need to put it out there. So option three is our lovely section X. So we would add value C and D for the common iliac arteries, and also, again, add value E for the device substance technology for new technology code. And uh, we were recommending option three, and I'm looking forward to comments. <laughs> State your name, please. Hi, uh, Keely Scamperly with WL Gore and Associates. And as a coder, I do echo um, the concerns expressed by the coders here about the X. Um, 
as well as uh, the um, comments expressed on the data analytics side. Uh, uh, echo those as well. And um, if we're going to talk about <laughs> option three, just one technical note where um, CMS is recommending um, maintaining the same body value of the lower arteries in the um, graphic. They've actually uh, reflected body system two, cardiovascular system. So we do want to keep that there in the lower artery section. Thank Typo. you. <laughs> Thank you, Kaylee. I'm Linda Holtzman, Clarity Coding. Uh, I'm not going to mention Section X <laughs> um, this time uh, because I don't understand why this proposal is necessary at all. Um, I, I understand that, that there's a new technology. I get it, okay, that there's a new technology. But um, in the interest of full disclosure, I worked on the, uh, the prior proposal in uh, September 2015, which uh, Gore chose uh, not to be involved in, um, and uh, I just went back to check uh, what, what that proposal looked like, and both of the options that were recommended in that proposal from 2015, from September 2015, included uh, uh, ways of uniquely identifying branched and fenestrated uh, endografts for the common iliac arteries. So I, I don't know if you're at liberty to discuss this, but is, is the implication that, that that was not approved, so this needs to, to, to be addressed separately? I cannot discuss it. However, okay. the reason that this is being presented is strictly because it is a new technology proposal. So it was felt that it should be presented okay. separately. Well, I would just point out, if at some point you, you are at liberty to discuss it, uh, or when, when the changes uh, are posted to the CMS website so we can see what's, what's coming for, uh, for 2000, uh, October 1st, 2016, uh, if any, any of those uh, from the September 2015 meeting were approved, th they should have already included a way to uniquely identify this. So, I, you know, I'll be on the lookout and I, I won't press you any further. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. And um, following up on Linda's comment, a lot of you are wondering, where is that file? Pat said it was posted. It is in the queue, so you can expect to find it where you found the meeting materials either later this afternoon or um, hopefully by tomorrow morning. Uh, hopefully no more technical difficulties with the website. Hi, Don Golfina with W.L. Gore. Just to clarify on Linda's comment, um, the, in, the original intent, um, Maddie, as you said, was do we need to um, make an application for a code because because we obviously knew that there was a schematic that had been presented, but we didn't know was it accepted. And of course, we did know that we had a new tech application to get in. So we were kind of between the rock and the hard place. We went ahead, provided the, um, you know, provided the application. Um, as Keeley said, we strongly prefer the keeping things in the surgical, not in the X section. Uh, we understand the you know, there may be some payment issues with a new technology if it's awarded and how do you, how do you manage that, but uh, uh, the intent was to keep the application for this in line with the September overall schematic, just to be clear. Thank you, Don. Are there any further comments? Okay, well, the interim coding device is uh, to continue coding as it appears in current coding. And I'll turn it back over to Pat. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to Maddie for pointing out that although I thought one of our files was visible, it's in the um, whatever that queue is when it's waiting to get out of the web base and show. So I'm hoping that this afternoon it'll, it'll show because Maddie did submit it. Okay, we're going to now move to item nine on the agenda, which is found on page 42 through 44. And for the next four topics, M Michelle Joshua is going to lead those. But I'll let you know a timing issue. The cafeteria has asked that we break for lunch at 12.30 to 1.30. So we'll see how these go. And at whatever time we have a break, it'll be about 12.30 for our lunch. Okay, the next item on our agenda today is the 
intravenous administration of Depitelio or Defibrotide. The issue today is there is no ICD-10 PCS code for the intravenous administration of Depitelio injection for the treatment of patients with hepatic venoocclusive disease. Here today to give us the clinical background of Defitelio is Dr. Stan Lechmer. Lechmer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of Jess Pharmaceuticals this request for new ICD-10 PCS code for the administration of Defitelio or Defibrotide. As a point of a disclaimer, <clears throat> The content of this ICD-10 Coordination and Maintenance Committee meeting presentation reflects clinical information, proposed label, and proposed trade name as submitted in the NDA. Also, please note that NDA is under active review with the FDA at this moment. So, a new technology and on payment or ANTEP application for Defitelio or Defibrotide injection for intravenous infusion has been submitted to CMS and is under review for an 2017 effective date. An ICD-10 PCS code is necessary to identify the intravenous administration of the Fitelio in the inpatient hospital setting. This unique coding is a requirement for ANTEP purposes. <clears throat> Defitelio or Defibrotide represents a substantial clinical improvement and fulfills a significant unmet treatment need. Defitelio or Defibrotide is proposed as an indication for treatment for patients with hepatic venoocclusive disease, or VOD, also known as sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, or SOS, with evidence of multi-organ dysfunction following hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Upon approval by the FDA, Defitelio would be the first and only approved treatment for patients with VOD with evidence of multi-organ dysfunction following hematopoietic stem cell transplant. It is important to say that Defibrotide has an orphan designation. It is currently under priority review and proposed trade name of Defitelio is conditionally approved by the FDA. As a way of a background information, hematopoietic stem cell transplant is a potentially curative intervention used to treat many different malignant diseases. VOD is a potentially life-threatening early complication of transplant and the barrier to potentially life-saving intent of hematopoietic stem cell transplant. HCT patients with VOD with evidence of multi-organ dysfunction face a real and immediate risk of death with a mortality rate of over 80% when only supportive care is applied. Importantly, there are no FDA-approved treatments for a VOD at this time. However, treatment with Defitelio in clinical trials resulted in statistically significant improvement in day plus 100 post-transplant survival and complete response rates, as I will show a little bit later. For this audience, it is important to emphasize that Medicare IPPS standard analytic files contain over 5,000 patients who received hematopoietic stem cell transplant. 32% of those patients were aged 20 to 64 age, 68% of them were 65 or older. I have said that VOD with multi-organ dysfunction carries an extremely high risk of mortality. Here, it is also important to say what is the total incidence of VOD. So the literature reports VOD anywhere between 8 and 15 patients in patients undergoing transplant, and even in patients who are these days receiving reduced intensity conditioning for allogeneic transplant, cumulative incidence of VOD has been still reported in a ballpark of 9%, with incidence of VOD with multi-organ dysfunction around 1.5%. VOD is a complex syndrome. It is characterized by enlarged liver, jaundice, ascites, fluid retention, and weight gain. Multi-organ dysfunction adds to this syndrome characteristical signs of pulmonary, cardiac, and renal failure, which typically develop between 21 and 28 days post-transplant. Current treatment options of VOD consist largely of supportive care, and again, there is no FDA-approved treatment of, FDA, uh, of VOD and pharmacological treatment options are largely experimental 
and or abandoned altogether due to lack of efficacy and toxicity. <clears throat> Thus, defibrotate really truly offers a new option for these patients because the mechanism of action of uh, defibrotide addresses the underlying pathophysiology of VOD. We believe that defibrotide acts via stabilization of endothelial cells and also via restoration of thrombofibrinolytic balance. Defibrotide stabilizes endothelial cells by reducing their activation and thus protecting them from further damage due to chemotherapy or radiotherapy through a number of uh, molecular pathways listed here. It is important also to say that defibrotide enhances enzymatic activity of plasmin, hydrolyzing fibrin clots in situ to soluble fibrin degradation products and thus relieving symptoms of VOD. In our pivotal study, 20501, we have recorded improved survival a day plus 100 compared to historical control. It is also important to say that this, uh, public, that this study has just been published in the peer-reviewed official publication of American Society of Hematology Blood. Primary endpoint of day plus one survival post-transplant is widely accepted by the transplant community as a standard endpoint for assessing survival post-transplant. It is used by independent researchers investigating outcomes from VOD. By using this endpoint as a primary endpoint of our pivotal study, we have found that in 102 post-transplant patients with VOD, with multi-organ dysfunction, uh, day plus 100, day plus 100 survival was 38.2% versus 25% in historical controls treated by supportive care only. This difference between co uh, treatment arm and control, uh, control arm were statistically significant and clinically meaningful. Also, we have recorded in this study statistically significant improvement in complete response rate by day plus 100 compared to historical control. Clinically relevant and meaningful measurement of the resolution of VOD as well as resolution of any associated multi-organ dysfunction has been recorded in almost a quarter of a patients treated with defibrotide compared to only 12.5% in the historical control. This, statistic, this difference was also statistically significant. It is important to emphasize also in this very ill patient population that Defitelio has shown consistent evidence for a manageable safety profile. The overall incidence of treatment emergent adverse events, including non-serious as well as serious and fatal events are all well characterized by the transplant community. Also, adverse events of the fetalio can be manageable by a properly trained transplant physicians. The most common adverse reactions with treatment are hemorrhage, hypotension, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. In summary, the Fitelio represents substantial clinical improvement for a significant unmet need. Without treatment, hematopoietic stem cell patients with VOD with evidence of multi-organ dysfunction face, as I have said, an immediate and real risk of death with a mortality rate of more than 80% when only supportive care is applied. Treatment with defitelio demonstrates a statistically significant, clinically relevant, and meaningful improvement in day plus 100 survival and complete response compared to patients treated with supportive care only. Importantly, defitelio offers an effective treatment to benefit even the patients with the worst prognostic uh, factors related to hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Our clinical studies have shown a manageable and consistent safety profile supporting the positive benefit risk of defitelio treatment. Finally, when approved by the FDA, defitelio will be the first and only approved treatment for patients with VOD with evidence of multi-organ dysfunction following hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So, the proposed dosage and administration of defitelio are as follows. Based on the totality of our clinical evidence, the recommended dose of defitelio is 6.25 milligrams per kilogram per body weight given as a two-hour intravenous infusion every six hours for the total dose of 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. 
It is important to emphasize that dosing should be based on the patient's baseline body weight, defined as the patient's weight prior to the preparative regimen for the hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Also, defitelio should be administered as soon as diagnosis of hepatic VOD with evidence of multi-organ dysfunction is made. Defitelio should be administered for a minimum of, of 21 days, and if after 21 days, signs and symptoms of hepatic VOD have not resolved, defitelio should be continued until a resolution. This recommendation, as I said, is based on our clinical program, and in our pivotal study, the median duration of the treatment of patients with defitelio was 21.5 days. <coughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Clinical questions for Dr. Lechmer. Okay, we'll move into the coding options then. Okay. Coding options for the IV administration of the fibrotide include current coding options from table 3E0 with the root operation of introduction. Coding option one would be not to create a new code and to continue using the current coding option as described in table 3EO. Coding option two would be to capture the intravenous administration of defibrotide, create a new qualifier value, defibrotide in the sixth character substance value injection in the same table, 3EO, of the administration section of ICD-10 PCS. Coding option three would be to create a new code in the new technology section, section X of ICD-10 PCS to capture the intravenous administration of defibrotide by creating a device substance or a new device substance technology value defibrotide injection. And that would be adding an option nine. CMS recommends creating a new code in the Section X for new technology for the ad IV administration of defibrotide. Interim coding advice would be to continue using the current coding option using table 3E0. Do we have any comments regarding the coding of the intravenous administration of defibrotide? No comments? Okay, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Lechpamer. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Okay. Oh, we had a question. All right, we'll move into our next agenda item, and that would be the administration of Vistagard or uridine triacetate. The issue is there is no ICD-10 PCS code for the administration of Vistagard, uridine triacetate, oral granules, a pyrimidine analog indicated for the emergency treatment of fluoruracil or capacitabine overexposure in adults and pediatric patients. Should we create a new code? Here to present the clinical background is Mr. Thomas King of Vistagard. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back at CMS. Um, I'm here to talk about Vistagard. Uh, it's our newly approved uh, antidote for 5-fluorouracil toxicity. 5-fluorouracil um, is a, a very heavily used agent uh, in a treatment of uh, a broad range of cancers, ranging from colorectal to breast, head, neck, uh, and pancreatic. Uh, it's used by approximately 275,000 patients uh, annually, and about 3% of those, or roughly uh, 8,250 of those patients, are going to exhibit some degree of toxic reaction, and uh, at a frequency of about 0.5% annually, uh, that'll result in around uh, 1,300 deaths, uh, resulting directly from the use of 5-fluorouracil. Um, oftentimes, uh, the cause of 5-fluorouracil overexposure is because of an overdose, uh, and this could be due to uh, an infusion pump uh, error, uh, a malfunction or programming error, 
and uh, there have been uh, pharmacy transcription errors that have been documented as well. And uh, additionally, um, about 10 to 20 percent of patients that are treated with a standard therapeutic dose of 5-fluorouracil um, exhibit genetic uh, clearance defects, which basically impair their ability to uh, catabolize or eliminate 5-fluorouracil. And that leads to a uh, severe uh, early onset treatment-related toxicity. And amongst the most common causes for impaired clearance of 5-fluorouracil is a deficiency in an enzyme called dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase, and, uh, or DPT for short. A DPT is responsible for the elimination of about 85% of 5-fluorouracil in the body. So if there is an issue with DPD, then obviously a patient's going to have some, uh, some issues. Um, the toxicities of 5-fluorouracil overexposure are very serious, um, and they progress rapidly. And before the, uh, or in the early development stages of this product, uh, we did uh, an analysis of historical outcomes, and these were uh, basically cases that were pulled from uh, the literature, the biomedical literature from medical legal cases uh, and databases, as well as FDA safety reporting. And what we found was, uh, in most cases, uh, overdoses, which uh, for the sake of a standardized definition were basically uh, the re uh, a, when a patient received uh, greater than two times the maximum tolerated dose of 5-fluorouracil uh, for their own individual situation. Uh, what happened is most, most, and again, there's not a lot of uh, cases that are available in the literature, um, but the ones that we did found, it was almost uniformly fatal uh, when a patient was exposed to that much 5-fluorouracil uh, due to an overdose. And typically the overdoses of 5-fluorouracil fall into two categories. Either uh, uh, a patient um, begins to get their infusion and within minutes, uh, an infusion that should have taken days uh, runs through their system, uh, be, again, because of a programming error or because of an issue with the infusion pump, and the bag's empty. Uh, so basically, that's a sign, you know, we have an issue here. Even though patients often are asymptomatic and can be for up to 48 hours, afterwards they can start to show uh, some signs of severe toxicity. And then uh, the other situation uh, is, is that the rate uh, or I'm sorry, the, the volume or the overall expected volume of uh, a bolus infusion uh, is too high. So instead of it being 100 milligrams, maybe it's 1,000 milligrams. So, so rate and volume really are the two uh, central issues with, uh, with overdose. So um, the FDA approved Vistagard in December 2015, and that was uh, after uh, a priority review. Uh, it was granted orphan drug designation, and uh, we have submitted a, a new technology add-on payment. Um, and, and really quickly, our uh, indication is sort of a, a bifurcated indication. Uh, one is for uh, 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 administration following a frank uh, overdose uh, of either fluorouracil or uh, its oral prodrug, uh, capecitabine, which is also known as Zalota, and that's regardless of the presence of symptoms. So again, I said that uh, sometimes patients, after they've been overdosed, they will be asymptomatic for a short period of time before uh, the, the toxicity situation basically explodes. And then the other uh, set of patients that uh, Vistagard is indicated for is for patients who exhibit early onset severe or life-threatening toxicity, and typically those toxicities are, are those that affect the cardiac or central nervous system, uh, and uh, in some cases uh, more frequently observed are toxicities related to uh, GI issues such as early uh, high-grade mucositis or, uh, or neutropenia or leukopenia, and typically I, I, those will begin uh, very soon after infusion, and our indication has sort of an outer limit of 96 hours. Uh, basically, uh, the drug hasn't been studied beyond the 96-hour time point, and the thought is that uh, if administration is delayed beyond 96 hours, the patient's not going to get the full benefit of the product. So this is a pretty high-level uh, 
Um, actually, I'm going to move ahead a slide here and then come back. Uh, the first step in, um, in, in the activity or the mechanism of action of Vistagard is uh, when it's ingested, uh, as, a, as it being a prodrug of uridine, it's broken down by nonspecific esterases in the gut to uridine, and then it's very uh, efficiently and quickly absorbed into the GI tract, and that's because it's lipophilic. And basically what you get is uh, four to seven fold more bioavailable uridine uh, than what you would get if you administered uridine itself. And uh, following uh, the oral administration of the uh, oral granules of Vistagard, uh, it's rapidly deacetylated, as I had said, into these, with, by these nonspecific esterases, and you get uh, a high volume of uridine that's uh, released into the circulation. So after, uh, after Vistagard is broken down in, from uridine triacetate to uridine, uh, it exerts its mechanism effects primarily uh, on the RNA, uh, the RNA side of the 5-fluorouracil, uh, of 5-fluorouracil's mechanism of action. So basically, uh, it's kind of important to understand uh, five fluor how 5-fluorouracil works to understand how Vistagard works. So basically, 5-fluorouracil uh, works by disrupting DNA synthesis, and that's what you see on the uh, uh, on the left-hand side of this graphic. And then uh, it also uh, has an effect on RNA. Uh, and basically uh, what it's doing is uh, uh, 5-fluorouracil will become incorporated as a false nucleotide into a growing RNA chain, uh, and then it breaks down into a number of different metabolic intermediates. And it's the metabolic intermediates um, from this breakdown that cause the majority of the toxicities. So the, the, the DNA uh, activity of 5 fluorouracil is, uh, is, is by far uh, the major anti-tumor mechanism of 5 fluorouracil. Um, Vistagard acts on the other side, which is the RNA processing side. And basically what it does is it floods the cell with uridine. Um, which is a, an essential component of the, the growing RNA chain as opposed to the toxic intermediates that you would see uh, coming from 5-fluorouracil metabolites. Um, so the clinical trial program uh, for uridine triacetate, or <laughs> Vistagard, uh, essentially was a compassionate use program, so we didn't have uh, a placebo arm in this, obviously. We received cases of patients who had been overdosed or who received uh, a dose of, uh, a normal dose of 5-fluorouracil and started to exhibit uh, very early uh, life-threatening uh, signs and symptoms. And as you can see here, uh, study one is listed as the uh, expanded access program. This was the U.S.-based program. Um, we have uh, started, uh, we've actually commercialized the product and uh, our uh, uh, first sale date was March 2nd. So the expanded access program is actually no longer ongoing, even though it says that on the slide. Um, sl uh, study number two is an emergency use program that's global uh, and that is ongoing in the rest of the world other than the United States. But this gives you a general idea of the number of patients that were enrolled because of a frank overdose or because they exhibited signs of uh, severe onset tox or early onset toxicity. Um, the two, uh, really the, the, the main study endpoints that we had uh, were pretty straightforward. Um, the major efficacy outcome was survival. Basically, if a patient made it to 30 days uh, after uh, administration of Vistagard, that was considered to be a treatment success. Um, if they resumed their previous chemotherapy regimen, and obviously in a lot of patients with early onset toxicity, they would switch from 5-fluorouracil to another agent. Um, but if they resumed their chemotherapy uh, before that 30-day window ended, then we considered that to be a treatment success as well. Yep. So um, bottom line with this, uh, pretty much the majority of the patients survived. We had about a 97% success rate uh, in the overdose patients. Uh, the early onset patients, around 90% survived, and that gave us an overall survival rate of around 96%. Um, 
really quick uh, about Vistagard. Um, in patients who uh, who did receive a massive overdose of 5-fluorouracil, if they received the product um, before showing signs and symptoms of toxicity, typically those patients would never go on to exhibit uh, some signs at all. Uh, and that's mostly because uh, uh, the effect of the product uh, happened within that uh, within the optimal 96-hour treatment window. Um, we had about 38% of our patients uh, in study one and study two who were able to resume chemotherapy uh, within 30 days after the uh, 5 fluorouracil issue. And uh, the median uh, time to resumption of chemotherapy was 19 days. So really quick, uh, the dosage and administration is based on our clinical trials. Uh, to receive an adequate uh, dose and coverage of Vistagard, uh, adequate enough to head off toxicities, patients would uh, receive a 10 gram packet orally every six hours for a total of 20 doses. So this comes out to about a five day uh, dosing regimen. Uh, most of the patients received uh, the product orally uh, through granules with some soft food or something like that, but some patients received it through uh, uh, another route, like an NG tube or an OG tube. But again, the, uh, the important take home with this is uh, number of doses, uh, roughly 19 to 20, so most patients did complete therapy, and for the most part, they completed it within five days. So um, we, we have a, a, a need, therefore, for a unique uh, ICD-10 uh, PCS code. Uh, and this is as part of our uh, NTAP, uh, our NTAP uh, request. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, the recommendation that we, uh, you know, we put forward for it. That's it. Are there any clinical questions for Mr. King? I don't know if this is working or not. Yes. I'll let you stay here. No, it's, it, it's orally administered and then broken down in the GI tract. Did you want to? Yeah, it's an orally administered drug and it's broken down in the gut. So I'm not sure what the question is. So, <laughs> is it a clinical question or a coding question? Well, I just want to make sure it was <laughs> absorbed in the gut and not dissolved in the mouth. That's correct, yeah. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Are there any additional clinical questions? Okay, with that, we'll go on to the coding options. Okay, coding options for the administration of Vistagard or uridine triacetate. Current coding options include using values from table 3EO in the current ICD-10 PCS codes available. Coding option one would be not to create a new ICD-10 PCS code and continue using the codes in table 3EO for the administration of Vistagard. 
Coding option two, to capture the administration of Vistagard uridine triacetate, create a new qualifier value R uridine triacetate in the same table, 3EO, for the administration section of ICD-10 PCS. Coding option three would be to create a new technology code in section X to capture the oral administration of Vistagard by creating the value uridine triacetate for the sixth character value to describe the device, substance, or technology. At this time, CMS recommends option three, creating a new code in the section X, new technology section of ICD-10 PCS. Interim coding advice would be to continue using one of the codes in table 3EO. That's what that should say. Are there any comments regarding the coding? Good afternoon, Laurie Johnson from Panacea Healthcare Solutions. Um, the comment that I have is um, in the past when we've had orally administered medications that we use the national drug code instead of creating a, in the past, ICD-9 volume three code and was wondering, was there a reason that we didn't use that approach? Because I'm not sure that from a clinical perspective that the patient's required to be an inpatient to have this drug administered. That's a very good point. And frankly, that was one of the reasons that we created the X code. Because in the past, historically, we've never coded handing somebody drugs to take by mouth. but. Uh, we tried to use workaround solutions when we had new technology and go to NDC codes, HCPC codes, and other things. It was a systems problem and a challenge. And we decided that we had to capture all these new technologies within the same umbrella system, ICD-10 PCS. And so that was one of the uh, driving forces for creating it, is that we capture everything, even the things not historically captured. Organ perfusion would be another one that was not historically captured. But if you do want to capture it, it's best to do it with the umbrella of the current coding system as opposed to multiple places on the bill reporting other data elements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any additional comments? Okay, with that, we will move on to the next item in our agenda, the insertion of spinal bracing and distraction system. Do we have Dr. Guillaume present? Wonderful, okay. Is Dr. Guillaume on the line or present? Michelle K. Yes. O'Connor Massey for Lids Technologies. Dr. Guillaume was expecting to be on the agenda at 1.30. Okay. What time is it now? Can we move on to Is that acceptable? Then? Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Kate. Kate. Let me check with Maddie since this person, it will be ready at 1.30. Uh, Maddie, I think you, Dr. Romano, will not be here till this afternoon either. Is that correct? Then why don't we do the very end topics now. They'll be short and it'll be easy to think about something light before lunch. And I'll impose on um, Charlie to go to the ICD-10 PCS update things so the gym structure and addenda slides, if he can find those for us. And Charlie, it's the very last set of slides. Thank you. 
We have in your handouts today, uh, starting on page 57 through the very end through 75, we have some uh, information on the kinds of gem update requests we've gotten so far and how we've evaluated them and some of the addenda and key updates we've received so far and how we've looked at them. Rhonda Butler, who prepares these and does a wonderful job with this, was going to be here to present today, but she sat in um, and an airport on the west coast most of the day yesterday waiting for her plane to be fixed and it wasn't so she was not able to get here so i'm just going to refer you to those and have you look at them and just say that we do have these gems up updates change documents for you and i would urge you to look at them and review them and send us your comment and then to say that we also are going to be posting as i told you earlier the gem updates we said we would do those up to three years, uh, you know, following the implementation. And so we plan to do them up through October 1st, 2018. Now, as you all will recognize, the gyms were a good tool when you were converting systems in advance of ICD-10. And there were challenges that we all know because they're only one tool you use in addition to using the code books. And so the value of the gems with each year of IC9 not being updated will decrease and decrease, particularly as we update the ICD-10 codes a couple of times. So they probably will be of use to some people who are looking at maybe trend data this time, but as the year goes on, they will decrease. And for that reason, we, uh, the last planned update is October 1st, 2018. And for those of you who write to me on almost an hourly basis and say the gyms aren't perfect and converting this edit or this coverage, and I'll just say to you once again, if you read the, the uh, gym user guide, boy, do we know it and that we always use pe urge people to code from the actual document themselves and just use the gym as one tool. And with each year, it becomes a less valuable tool. So with that information, then you will just see that we've uh, provided some examples of the kinds of public comments we have, and I would urge you to read through those at your leisure. Um, and now that you, many of you are only seeing this for the first time, and you'll see the comment about how we've updated them, and we'd love for you to comment on those. We are also updating some uh, root operation definitions, and um, we would ask you to look at the, the agenda we provided for that and, and see if you agree with some things that we're considering doing. We have some body part keys. People love these body part keys, and so as we get suggestions, we're going to suggest information to update them. We would like you to look for the detailed attachments in our document and tell us if you agree. And if, if it brings to mind something else you want to put in, we would love for you to bring that to our attention too, and particularly more issues that we can address at the September meeting. So that's all the gems and the addendum things. I want you to look through and send those by April the 8th. And at this point, we are going to stop for lunch. We will return at 1.30, where we will have two remaining topics. And I'm not sure, maybe that Dr. Romano will have to defer later into Donna Pickett's section if he's not here. But we definitely will be starting the ICD-10-CM diagnosis topics very early after lunch, so that hopefully Donna can complete all of her topics before our early end time tomorrow. And thank you, everyone. I think you all know where the cafeteria is. Mm -hmm. Hi. Oh, how about you? Well, Great.